Tensions between 33-year-old Robin Spielbauer and 28-year-old Katie had been simmering for a while. Katie was once Robin's friend, but after Robin divorced her husband, things took a turn. In one argument, Katie followed Robin into the house and physically attacked her, grabbing her by the hair. Robin managed to kick Katie away, who then landed in the fireplace. These incidents continued, and it was evident that both Katie and Robin harbored intense hatred for one another. They wanted to kill each other. Then, on April 8, 2014, a group of women made a gruesome discovery on Helium Road in Amarillo. They found the lifeless body of a woman covered in blood. Who was the victim? What had happened to her? Welcome to M7 Crime Storytime, where we cover solved, unsolved, and twisted cases from across the world. Nestled in the heart of the Lone Star State of Texas, Amarillo stands as a testament to the enduring spirit of the American West. Its name, which means yellow in Spanish, hails from the nearby Amarillo Creek, known for its golden wildflowers that bloom in abundance. The name not only lends the city its distinct identity, but also reflects the warm and welcoming nature of its residents. Amarillo, home to about 200,000 people, is often referred to as the Yellow Rose of Texas and offers a unique blend of history, culture, and modernity that captivates visitors and leaves a lasting impression. Founded in the late 19th century as a railroad town, Amarillo's roots run deep in the rich soil of Texan history. Beyond its historical charm and cowboy culture, Amarillo is a modern hub with a thriving art scene and a dynamic economy. In the midst of its thousands of residents lived the 33-year-old woman named Robin Spielbauer, who would become the talk of the town. Robin Spielbauer was born on October 23, 1981, at Altus Air Force Base in Jackson County, Oklahoma. From there, they moved to North Dakota, and finally, in 1995, they relocated once again to Amarillo, Texas, where Robin spent most of her childhood. Despite the change, Robin adapted well to her new surroundings. From a young age, Robin was known for her warm and welcoming personality, making friends wherever she went. Her company was so peaceful and positive that it was impossible for her friends and family to resist loving her. In 2003, Robin's life took a momentous turn when she crossed paths with Jeremy Spielbauer on a random evening. They danced all night long and knew that they'd found a lifelong partner in each other. Their connection blossomed, and after a two-year romance, they were married in 2005. The happy times were only beginning, as it wasn't long before Robin discovered she was going to become a mother. She gave birth to the couple's first child, a baby girl who they named Jaden. Soon enough, the couple was blessed with another girl, Harley. Unlike fictional fairy tales, real-life love stories don't always have a happily ever after. Robin and Jeremy's marriage soon began to fall apart. The major problem in their marriage began when Jeremy began to have affairs, and it wasn't a one-time mistake that could be forgiven and forgotten. It happened repeatedly. This continuous betrayal left Robin feeling shattered, and she sensed that her relationship was on the brink of collapse. It was a lonely and heartbreaking time for Robin, a mother of two who was experiencing the fall of marriage with the man of her dreams. Robin Spielbauer and Jeremy attended church regularly, possibly seeking guidance and blessings to mend their relationship. It was during these church visits that they met Katie Phipps. Finding a friend in Katie provided her with some solace, as she could share her struggles and gain strength from their connection. Despite Robin's efforts, Jeremy's extramarital affairs persisted, and his behavior showed no signs of improvement. When Robin learned of yet another affair, it became the final straw for her. After enduring seven years of heartache and betrayal, Robin finally made the tough decision to leave Jeremy in 2012, taking their children with her and filing for a divorce. Betrayals cut deep when you confide in someone during your most vulnerable moments, only for them to intentionally cause you harm. This is precisely what Robin experienced when she discovered that her husband's latest affair was with her friend, Katie Phipps. 
Without any doubt, Robin and Katie's once treasured friendship turned extremely sour. Within a year, wedding bells rang again, but this time it was Katie standing beside Jeremy at the altar. This development further strained the already troubled relationship between Robin and Katie. In fact, their conflicts occasionally escalated to physical confrontations. Following their marriage, Jeremy and Katie chose a residence in close proximity to Robin and her daughters. There were constant fights and arguments between them. Despite hating the current dynamics, Robin couldn't really do much about it. She had to remain in contact with Jeremy because they had kids together, and that meant her contact with Katie was inevitable. Tensions between the two women reached a boiling point around Thanksgiving 2013 when Katie found flirtatious messages between her husband and his ex-wife on Facebook. So, when Robin arrived to collect her daughters, a heated altercation ensued. Katie followed Robin inside the house and physically assaulted her, grabbing her by the hair. This confrontation escalated and resulted in Robin falling to the floor with Katie on top of her. In an attempt to defend herself, Robin managed to kick Katie away, but she unknowingly sent her tumbling into the fireplace. Despite this violent encounter, no charges were pressed at the time. On April 8, 2014, a group of women driving along Helium Road near County Road 34 in West Randall County of Amarillo, Texas, spotted something highly unusual. Along a dirt road, they noticed a parked Chevy Tahoe SUV, and nearby, they saw what appeared to be a person covered in blood. Alarmed by the sight, they promptly contacted the police. Upon arriving at the scene, the officers found a woman lying in a pool of her own blood. She had a serious injury at the back of her head. The investigators could immediately tell that this was no random incident. It seemed like a deliberate and planned attack. It appeared as though someone had intentionally lured the victim to this location with the intent to end her life. They carried out the initial search of the area, but they couldn't find any phone, purse, or ID in the area near the body. The car's windshield had some damage with star-shaped marks that looked like a rock hit it. In one of those marks, they found a pink substance. They ran a check of the vehicle and found that the SUV was registered under Robin Spielbauer's name. However, to positively ID the victim, investigators needed the help of forensic science. Her body was immediately sent for autopsy, and it was soon revealed that the victim was, in fact, Robin. The report also highlighted that her tragic demise was the result of severe blunt force trauma and a gunshot wound to the back of the head caused by a 22 caliber gun. The medical examiner believed that Robin had died around 9.30 to 10 p.m. on April 7, 2014. The focus of suspicion landed squarely on Robin's ex-husband, Jeremy, who immediately denied any involvement in her murder. On the surface, he had no motive for such a heinous act. Despite the friction in their relationship, they had already separated and there seemed to be no conceivable benefit for Jeremy and Robin's death. However, this was just one layer of the story. Digging deeper, they found that there was a long-standing catfight between Katie and Robin. Multiple statements from Robin's relatives attested to the hostile relationship between Katie and Robin. What further fueled the detective's suspicion towards Katie was a text message she sent to Jeremy on the very day of Robin's murder. The text ominously read, My dreams of having a happy family are gone. I'm not going to make you carry this burden anymore. You started it, and I'll finish it. The long-standing feud between the two didn't solely originate from Robin's side. Katie also held and reciprocated strong negative feelings towards Robin. Katie was so convinced that Jeremy and Robin were having an affair that she repeatedly questioned him about it through text messages, despite Jeremy's denials. In the four days leading up to Robin's tragic death, Katie bombarded Jeremy with approximately 300 of these messages. It was evident that Katie and Robin had a strained relationship, making Katie the primary suspect in the case. But the question was, why now? Did she find out something more recent? The detectives theorized that Katie must have found concrete evidence that Robin was, in fact, having an affair with Jeremy. That would have triggered her, which may have ultimately led to Robin's murder. Katie was so sure that something was going on between her husband and his ex-wife that even when she was questioned by the police, Katie inquired about Jeremy's potential infidelity with Robin. 
The investigators couldn't provide concrete proof, but mentioned that they had made plans to meet that night. This news naturally affected Katie, and she started crying. It seemed like a genuine reaction. If she'd known about their plans, it wasn't very likely that she'd have brought the topic up on her own. However, just as suspicions around Katie appeared to ease, a new revelation emerged. The detectives came across an image Katie had once posted, a photo proudly displaying a 22 caliber gun with a distinctive pink trim. The police secured a search warrant and found out that the gun was registered under Katie's name. When they inspected the gun, they noticed that a fragment of the gun was broken off. Despite all the evidence, Katie continued to deny these allegations. She claimed that she never made any threats to harm Robin. However, testimonies from multiple people suggested otherwise. The detectives thought that they were close to cracking the case when Katie herself asked for a polygraph test. Katie's lawyers had advised her not to take a polygraph test. However, she wanted to prove her innocence. The results did not come out in her favor, and it was clear that she'd been telling lies all along. Katie was in even bigger trouble now. She also couldn't prove where she was at the time of the murder. She claimed she was at a friend's house in the 1900 block of Karen Street near Helium Road and insisted she'd not seen Robin that night. To make things more complicated, she'd turned off her cell phone, which meant the suspicion on her was only getting worse. It had become difficult to confirm her whereabouts. Katie openly acknowledged her personal animosity towards Robin. Despite this, she empathized with the fact that she'd grown up without parents and highlighted that no matter what kind of animosity was between her and Robin, she'd never subject Robin's children to a similar fate. While suspicions were looming over Katie, Katie herself began to develop her own suspicions. If the pink substance from her gun was found at the crime scene and she didn't use the gun, there was just one other person who could have used it and lied right to her face. Katie dropped a bombshell on the police, confessing that she was beginning to suspect that her husband, Jeremy, might be involved in Robin's murder and had tried to frame Katie for it. The investigation took a dramatic twist when Jeremy's cell phone records revealed that he had, in fact, been in contact with Robin on the very night she was killed. The detective's initial theory turned out to be true. The two had planned to meet on Helium Road. Under pressure, Jeremy came clean. He admitted to meeting Robin on Helium Road on April 7, 2014, as planned, but he revealed that Katie had unexpectedly arrived and started an argument with Robin, knocking on the car window. Jeremy claimed he tried to defuse the situation, but eventually left while the two women were still bickering. The very next day, on April 8, 2014, Robin was discovered dead. The police had gathered sufficient evidence, leaving them convinced of Katie's involvement. Consequently, a mere three days after Robin's body was discovered, Katie Phipps found herself under arrest, facing a charge of capital murder. She was just 32 years old when she was incarcerated. It was a perplexing situation. Katie's claims clashed with the mounting evidence, but the detectives were determined to build a strong case against her. While she was in county jail, a glimmer of hope emerged. In this case filled with so many twists, the story took another angle which left everyone shocked. Prosecutors introduced new evidence in the case. They mentioned that even though Katie's phone was turned off when the crime seemed to have occurred, her 11-year-old son was constantly using his phone, which was connected to Wi-Fi. And he was with his mother, Katie, all day. The FBI were able to use his phone records to figure out where they'd been. These records showed that Katie was not near Helium Road at 9.50 p.m. when Robin was believed to have been shot. This bombshell cell phone tracking evidence meant the case against her had to be dropped and ultimately exonerated Katie in connection to Robin's death. After spending 466 days in jail, she was released. Katie Phipps, you were recently released from county jail after nearly a year and a half. And spent 466 days in the Randall County Jail. Okay. And how do you feel about uh, being free, being the charges being dropped? It is um, very good to be home. Okay. It was a very um, tremendous release. Uh, mm -hmm. 
During their efforts to sift through the clues, the detectives ended up finding someone whose phone had pinged in the same area where Robin was killed. Cell phone tracking data and surveillance cameras later placed Jeremy's vehicle at the location on that fateful night, raising suspicion of his involvement in his ex-wife's murder. The theory suggested that he may have enticed Robin, who intended to confront him about ending their relationship for good, to that spot. He'd been furious with Robin for making that decision, and in his anger, he headed straight to his truck where he grabbed a gun, which was later linked to the pink material found in the windshield and a broken piece that had chipped off. At first, Robin took precautions and locked herself inside her car to stay safe. However, she eventually got out of her vehicle, and that's when Jeremy shot her once. But the gun had malfunctioned, and he couldn't fire it again. In desperation, he resorted to using a tool from his car to hit Robin on the back of the head. The shocking part of this story is what happened next. Instead of owning up to his actions, Jeremy tried to make it seem like Katie was responsible for what had occurred. After murdering one woman who'd loved him, he was framing another. After Katie's release, investigators found another person who they say murdered Robin. Jeremy Spielbauer was arrested and indicted by a grand jury in April of 2016. Now Jeremy was the one facing a capital murder charge. Following the statements made against him by numerous people, Jeremy was apprehended in 2016. He was held in custody in Randall County Jail until he faced trial in 2018. From the witness stand, Phipps talked about how her marriage with Jeremy was falling apart. By the time Robin died in April 2014, they were arguing a lot. Most of their fights were about Katie suspecting that Jeremy still had feelings for Robin. She also told the jury about an incident that happened on April 10, 2014, just two days after Robin's body was found. She said that Jeremy got really angry grabbed her and pushed her against a wall at their South Manhattan Street home. That was when Jeremy told her that he'd handled the effing problem. On January 25, 2018, Jeremy was found guilty by a unanimous decision from a 12-member jury. He was convicted on the charge of felony murder and received a life sentence in prison along with a $10,000 fine. Nevertheless, his conviction was overturned in 2020 by the Seventh Court of Appeals due to concerns about the objectivity of two jurors during the case. This, this appeal being reversed is not about him being innocent. It is not about there being insufficient evidence to prove his guilt. That was not addressed in the court opinion. I believed in 2018 when, when this office tried the case that he was guilty of brutally murdering, murdering his wife, and I still believe that today. Many of those jurors continued to say things that would disqualify them. Two of those jurors were talked into rescinding their answer by the state, uh, and so they did not get excused, and so we get a limited number of, of jury, jury strikes to use later on for any reason. That ate into our number that we have, and the judge refused to give us any extras. So by law, that's, that's a procedural violation that, that, that should be remedied. Then in 2021, the same court reinstated Jeremy's conviction asserting that there were no errors in the jury selection process, as argued by the defense. Finally, the pieces of this complex puzzle finally fell into place. As for the children, Robin had worked hard at many jobs to give her two daughters a good life. After her death, the community organized a bike run and music festival to support her daughter's education. Jaden and Harley, Robin's daughters, are now living with their grandparents. Robin's case is a sad story of feuds and misunderstandings that went too far. Her life was full of troubles, from problems with her ex-husband to arguments with her ex-friend Katie. When the truth came out, Jeremy's real character was revealed. He killed Robin, but she was not his only victim. Katie, too, fell for his deception. She ended up divorcing Jeremy and managed to distance herself from him before he could harm her just like he did with Robin. In the end, the two women fought over a man who would not have hesitated to harm either of them. Josh calls me and asks if Sierra was at our house. And I said, no, she's not at our house. And he proceeded to tell me that he's tried calling her several times and her phone goes right to voicemail. I called my mom and she said, Sierra's not here. 
my dad was going to go out to the barn and look for her bike. A couple of minutes later, my father stated that Sarah's bike is not in the barn. That was the start of our nightmare. On July 19, 2016, 20-year-old Sierra Joggin was cycling back home along country roads in Fulton County, Ohio, when she mysteriously vanished. Her family started to panic when they discovered she'd left her boyfriend's house hours earlier. As police searched the cornfield surrounding the road for any sign of her, they discovered definite signs of a struggle, but no Sierra. An investigation into her disappearance was immediately launched, and as investigators dug deeper into finding the missing young woman, they soon discovered disturbing information that made the search for Sierra a race against time. What had happened to Sierra? Who had abducted her? Today, our case takes us to Delta, Ohio, a village in Fulton County. With a population of 3,300, it remains a close-knit community. Surrounded by acres of cornfields, Delta has a suburban rural atmosphere. Exactly how the village got its name remains a mystery. Some say it was because Bad Creek formed the Greek alphabet Delta as it meandered around the town. Others say it was named after the Delta post office opened by William Meeker in 1842. The family-friendly village is also rather safe in terms of crime, falling way under the U.S. national average. And that is why the village was rocked by this strange disappearance of Sarah Joggin in 2016. Sierra Catherine Joggin was born to Sheila Vasiluk and Tom Joggin on February the 11th, 1996 in Sylvania, Ohio. She was the eldest of five children with two brothers named Hunter and Carson and two sisters named Kayla and Ava. The family eventually relocated to Delta, Ohio. Sierra was described by many as being jovial, free-spirited, and kind. In 2014, she graduated from Evergreen High School and went on to pursue a degree in human resources at the University of Toledo in Ohio in 2015. After her first year at university, she returned home for the summer. While Sierra was home for the holidays, she began working as an intern at her uncle's business and spent time preparing for her junior year at university. When she wasn't hard at work, Sierra spent the days with her boyfriend of seven years, Josh Kolosinski, and cycling the country roads with the bike she'd recently bought at a garage sale. Sierra was a true country girl at heart and enjoyed cycling along the rural roads, taking in the sun and warmth of the day. However, this seemingly normal pastime would end up leading to tragedy. On July 19th, 2016, shortly after 5 p.m., Sierra wished her mother goodbye as she cycled towards her boyfriend Josh's house just seven miles away. It was a routine thing for her to do ever since she'd bought the bike. She'd spent some time with Josh before deciding to cycle back home at around 6.30 p.m. Although it was still bright outside, Josh decided to ride his motorcycle alongside Sierra on her journey home. The two enjoyed a casual ride back to her house and parted ways with a kiss at an intersection near Country Road 6. Thereafter, Josh went to visit a friend as Sierra made her way home. At 9.30 p.m., Sheila, Sierra's mother, returned from her evening classes only to discover that none of the lights in the house had been turned on. Sheila thought that Sierra might have decided to spend the night at Josh's house as she'd often done over the summer holidays. Thinking nothing of it, she went about her evening. At 10.30 p.m., Sheila received a call from Josh who asked to speak to Sierra. When Sheila told him Sierra wasn't home, Josh grew concerned. He explained that he left Sierra at an intersection just after 6.45 p.m. that evening. Josh then told Sheila that he'd sent several text messages to Sierra, but there was no reply. He'd also tried calling her, but the calls went straight to voicemail. Growing increasingly concerned, Sheila agreed to fetch Josh so that they could drive through the area looking for Sierra. Their fear was that Sierra had been hit while cycling and was possibly lying injured in a ditch. Sheila also contacted the Fulton County Police Department to report Sierra missing. Sheila also notified the rest of the family and several of Sierra's friends about what had happened. They immediately took to social media and asked people if they'd seen Sierra. Family members joined Sheila and Josh by driving through the country roads looking for Sierra. They'd also called several hospitals to find out if anyone had brought in an injured young woman 
but there was no sign of Sierra. Police asked Josh about the afternoon he spent with Sierra. Josh was forthcoming and offered the police the same explanation he'd given Sheila. But just as one team of officers was gathering information, another team was searching along Country Road 6, where Sierra was last seen. Just as the officers passed by a large section of corn, the spotlight highlighted a few broken corn stalks. They stopped the car and investigated on foot. As they moved through the field, several more stalks had been broken off. It was clear that some type of struggle had occurred. As officers waded into the cornfield, they came across several items. On the ground, they found a fuse box from a motorcycle, earbuds, a green sock, two pairs of sunglasses, a screwdriver, and a motorcycle helmet that appeared to be stained with blood. As they moved further, they found a purple bike which matched the description of the one belonging to Sierra. On the handlebars, officers noticed more blood splatter. There had also been tire tracks leading away from where Sierra's bike was found. They looked suspiciously like tracks made by a motorcycle. The discovery of motorcycle tire tracks and the helmet made investigators take a closer look at Josh, who was the last person to see Sierra. County police understood that the search for Sierra was going to require more manpower to cover the large area. They therefore requested help from the Federal Bureau of Investigation Office in Toledo, Ohio, as they took Josh in for further questioning. At the station, they asked Josh basic questions about his relationship with Sierra. He told investigators that he loved Sierra and planned on marrying her. They then asked him about what he and Sierra did that afternoon. Josh explained that the two of them went for a ride, Sierra on her bike and him on his motorcycle. Last night, you get off work at four? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me what, take me through um, from when you, when you get off and where you going. Uh, oh. During the day, she texted me and she's like, hey, what are you doing? And I said, come over. And she said, okay, I think I'm going to ride my bike. We sat around for a little while. It was probably a half hour, 45 minutes. We sat there and deciphered whether I should take her home or whether she wanted to ride her bike back. And she decided she wanted to ride her bike. And I had my motorcycle and I figured, you know, I'll follow her for a little bit and just kind of give her crap and stuff like that. So I followed her, she left, I followed her down the street. And I said, all right, she said, like, you can leave now. So kiss her goodbye, turn around, wow. Josh provided investigators with an alibi, which they later verified. He also showed them the pictures and video he'd made of Sierra and himself that same afternoon. When asked if Josh had any idea what happened to Sierra, he said that it angered him to think that it was possible that someone who knew Sierra may have attacked or harmed her. Josh told investigators that Sierra was not the type of girl to go down without a fight. What do you think? What happened? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, honest to God, have no idea. Yeah, I don't know if it was someone she knew, and that's what angers me. Sierra is a scrapper. She is. She is a strong girl, and if someone came up to her, she would have put up a fight. I guarantee it. Unless it happened like that. Unless it was, I can, I can see her having her music in, and you don't even hear someone coming up, and it's just, bam. That'd be the only way. After the interview, Josh allowed investigators to search his house. Inside, they found a pair of coveralls covered in blood. Josh explained that the blood was from an animal that he and his friends had shot while hunting. At Josh's house, they also found his helmet. Investigators checked with Josh's family and friends, and they confirmed that he'd been out riding with Sierra that afternoon and had returned after 7 p.m. With the story checked out, investigators needed to start looking for other possible leads and suspects in Sierra's disappearance. Josh then provided investigators with a possible lead. While riding his motorcycle, he'd come across a van that was driving suspiciously along Country Road 6. Josh was able to provide officers with a partial license plate number. Investigators were able to locate the woman who owned a white van similar to what Josh described. They explained their reason for the search and she allowed them to look through the van. There were no signs of blood even after forensic teams sprayed the van down with Blue Star, a chemical that enhances any traces of blood that may have been washed away. 
The woman explained to investigators that she was driving erratically because she thought someone was trying to drive her off the road. She was cleared and the investigation resumed from square one. The very next day, several teams of investigators from the county police and FBI set out to knock on the doors of people living in and around the area from where Sierra disappeared. Investigators were having little to no luck after questioning multiple individuals. They eventually came to a property surrounded by large barns. When they knocked on the door, it was answered by a man named James Worley. Unbeknownst to investigators, James was about to provide investigators with information that could just help them crack the case. James told investigators that he'd spent most of his afternoon riding around on his motorcycle on the afternoon that Sierra went missing. However, the motorcycle had kept stalling and this forced him to push the bike most of the way. He told officers that he'd not seen anyone who matched Sierra's description or anyone who looked suspicious in that area. James seemed very talkative as he explained to officers that he lived with his brother and elderly mother. He told them that he spent much of his time caring for his mother and running his own workshop from one of the barns in the yard. While talking to officers, James provided some interesting information. What he mentioned next caught the attention of investigators. James told officers that after his bike had stalled for the last time, he decided to push it into the cornfields along Country Road 6. As he made his way into the corn, he came across two bikes. One was blue and the other was charcoal gray. Um, I saw the two bikes. I'm pushing. And you're on, and and there's, you're on there's a corn field and I'm about half a mile down the road. Okay. There's two bikes sitting right in the wheat field. So back to the story here, I'm pushing my bike and uh, I had to stop and there was bicycles sitting there. And I thought to myself, I ain't gonna stand, stay out here. I pushed my bike into the cornfield because the end rows are open. It's 500 pounds. You can't just take that uh -huh. thing through the goddamn cornfield. I was in my head thinking, I'm going to ditch this thing, but there's these bikes here. Okay. This is probably my bike, bike and somebody else's bike. Okay. There was a blue one and a charcoal gray one, a light charcoal gray color. Okay. And they weren't put on their kickstands. They were just laying there. Investigators were growing curious as James started to provide more insight into what he was doing the afternoon Sierra had mysteriously vanished. James went on to tell the officers that he'd tried repairing his motorcycle in the cornfield. He couldn't manage to walk home because he suffered from sciatica, pain that affects the hip, back and legs, and is caused by a compressed spinal root nerve. As he explained to officers about the repairs, he made mention of a few key details that hadn't been made public knowledge. James said that he dropped several items in the field, which included a helmet, fuse box, screwdriver, and a pair of sunglasses, the very same evidence that investigators found at the scene. The situation, however, started to grow strange the longer investigators talked to James. He continued to question the motives of the investigation team and even offered them a chance to search the property multiple times. You want to look this place over, don't bring that with her dog, bring your other dog and go over this whatever and get it done so that I'm out of it. Investigators told him that it was not their intention to put any blame on him. They were just looking for answers from neighbors who may have seen anything out of the ordinary that Tuesday afternoon. James started to prattle on about how he believed the police were at his property under the guise of investigating Sierra's disappearance but instead wanted to pin the blame on him for some reason. You know, I know you got an ongoing problem, but don't try to beat me into the position of being part of it because I'm not. Just plain and simple. He went on to tell officers that he had witnesses that could prove he was at home. He further implied that it would have been impossible for him to kidnap the missing woman and put her on the back of his motorcycle without people seeing him do such a thing. Investigators calmed him down and once again explained that they were just looking for answers. But James's odd behavior had put him on their radar. As they left his property, investigators were already working to find out more about James Worley. It wouldn't take long for them to discover some disturbing information about the man who seemed determined to clear his name. As the crime lab processed the evidence, they would find James's fingerprints on the helmet discovered in the cornfield. The fingerprints were checked against CODIS, a national database of fingerprints. Investigators were in for shock with what they were about to learn. James Worley was born on April 8, 1959 in Tacoma, Washington. 
When he was still a child, his family moved to Ohio, and James had graduated from the same school as Sierra in 1978. He'd spent the majority of his life working as a farmer or farmhand in and around Toledo and Delta in Ohio. He'd started collecting a disability grant due to his declining health and was listed as a caregiver for his elderly mother. Looking through his records, investigators stumbled across something that gave them an eerie feeling. In 1990, James was arrested and charged with the abduction of a 26-year-old woman named Robin Gardner. Fortunately, Gardner had managed to escape from Worley and provided details to arresting officers about what had happened. Gardner explained that she'd been riding her bike along country roads in Whitehall, Ohio, when she was struck by a truck. The driver of the truck, whom she identified as James, then got out and threatened her with a screwdriver to her neck. He then told her to keep quiet or he'd kill her while he handcuffed her hands. By a stroke of luck, Gardner was able to fight against James as he tried to push her into the truck and flagged down a passing motorist who drove her to the police station. James was convicted of abduction and sentenced to serve between four to ten years in prison. However, after petitioning for an early release, James was released after just three years due to his good behavior. In 2000, James was once again arrested and convicted for cultivating marijuana plants and possessing firearms while on a disability grant. In 2002, he was released from prison after petitioning again for an early release. The eerie similarity between the attempted abduction of Robin Gardner and Sierra's disappearance turned the investigation into a true race against time. This time, when investigators went knocking on James's door, they were met with a very different attitude. The friendly James, the one who had joked with officers earlier that day, was gone. Instead, he seemed more irritable and defensive. The second time around, investigators also took note of fresh marks on his arms and bruising on his legs. James was starting to look rather suspicious. Having learned of James's past criminal history, they went prepared with a search warrant for the property. A search of the house and James's workshop didn't reveal anything out of the ordinary. There were no signs of anyone being held captive in either location. However, the search was about to take a twisted and disturbing turn. In the second barn, they found neatly stacked bales of hay. What struck them as strange, though, was that the area appeared to have been freshly raked. As investigators started to look around, James became agitated and tried to keep the conversation going. As investigators moved the haystacks aside, they found a mattress in the corner. There were fastenings on the wall, and the area looked like a dungeon of sorts. In the same area, they found duct tape, zip ties, diapers, and what appeared to be recording equipment. Another haystack was moved aside, and hidden beneath that was a green crate filled with flimsy lingerie. In order to explain away the discoveries, James told officers that he gave the lingerie away as gifts whenever he went out with a female friend. As for the dungeon-like setup, James told officers that he was interested in producing and directing adult movies. A pair of pink underwear was also found among the assortment of lingerie, and there appeared to be bloodstains on the underwear. When officers asked James about the underwear, he denied any knowledge of it. However, as more bales of hay were moved around, officers found a secret door hidden in the floor. When they opened the door, they discovered a freezer buried in the floor. The freezer had been fully carpeted, and several dark brown stains were visible on the material. James told officers that he used the freezer to store his marijuana, but they weren't buying the story. The overwhelming smell of bleach suggested to them that James had recently cleaned up. Despite all their searching, there was no sign of Sierra. All the evidence was bagged and sent off for testing, and investigators then searched the truck that James had been driving. In the truck, they found more zip ties and a ski mask. James was asked to come down to the station for questioning and to provide a fresh DNA sample for testing. Over the next several hours, James continued to proclaim his innocence. He tried to tell investigators that he would have been smarter and not left so much evidence behind if he was really responsible for abducting Sierra. He then told officers that he was tired of talking about the case and started rambling on about his daily life with his elderly mother. Investigators continued to speak with James as the results of the blood tests performed on the bike helmet and bike handlebars proved to belong to a female. The new evidence had also been processed as James remained at the station for questioning. 
The carpet lining in the freezer tested positive for human blood, and the blood found on the mattress and pink underwear also happened to match with the blood found on the bike helmet and handlebars. DNA matching was done against the blood samples and duct tape found at the scene. The results had all come back as being positive to match Sierra. James's DNA was also found on the piece of duct tape that had some of Sierra's DNA on it. James Worley was arrested and charged with the abduction of Sierra. In a matter of hours, though, the search for Sierra would reach a tragic conclusion. On the afternoon of July 22, 2016, a volunteer from the search team who had been walking along cornfields on Country Road 7 discovered a freshly overturned patch of soil. The cornfield was located just 12 miles from James's home. The volunteer immediately contacted the county police who rushed to the area. As they cordoned off the area and started to dig up the shallow grave, their hearts sank with the discovery of Sierra's body. We searched in an area around County Road 7, tragically found what we believe to be Sierra's remains. Sierra had been bound, gagged, and hogtied. Her wrists were handcuffed and her ankles bound in duct tape. Her wrists and ankles were then tied together behind her back with rope. She was clothed in a lacy camisole and an adult diaper, similar to the ones found in James's barn. Sierra was pronounced dead at the scene. Positive identification will be made through either fingerprints or DNA, but at this time, we strongly believe that this is Sierra. Sierra was a remarkable young lady with a contagious smile. She was a loving person who has touched many people in her life. We miss her and we will always love her. The Lucas County Deputy Medical Examiner, Dr. Cynthia Baser, performed Sierra's autopsy. She confirmed that Sierra had died as a result of asphyxiation due to the large dog toy that had been stuffed into her mouth as a gag, the force of which had also broken off two teeth in Sierra's mouth. She estimated that it would have taken about 10 minutes before Sierra lost all consciousness. There was also a fracture along Sierra's hairline that suggested she'd been hit with a heavy blunt object that may have incapacitated her. Sierra showed signs of assault, both physical and otherwise. James's charges were reviewed on July 22, 2016, and now included aggravated murder, kidnapping, felonious assault, and abuse of a corpse. James pleaded not guilty and was held without bail at the county jail awaiting trial. Investigators continued to find more evidence that linked James to the death of Sierra. Cell phone records showed that James's and Sierra's phones had pinged off the same cell tower for nearly an hour. Both phones had also followed the same path before Sierra's was turned off. These phones were in the general area of each other. Remember, the spreadsheets don't tell me exactly where the phone is. It, it's in these general areas. Um, so that these phones on different networks were in the same general area at the same general time. A search of James's computer also painted a disturbing picture. James, it seems, had become obsessed with adult videos that depicted women being kidnapped, hogtied, and held captive in dungeon-like rooms. Computer data also showed that James had been watching these videos for most of the morning on Tuesday, July 19, 2016, just hours before he'd abduct Sierra. Prosecutors and investigators developed a theory about what happened on the day Sierra went missing. They believed that James had spent the entire day watching adult videos and had decided to go for a ride on his motorcycle that afternoon. In a tragic twist of fate, James spotted Sierra cycling along Country Road 6. The prosecution believed that because Sierra had been listening to music through her earphones, she didn't hear James speed up behind her. They then surmised that James rammed into Sierra's bike and knocked her off the road into a ditch. James then removed his helmet and knocked Sierra out cold. He proceeded to move Sierra, her bike, and his motorcycle into the cornfield as it was still bright outside and he didn't want to be caught. He waited for two hours, as per the cell phone activity that investigators were able to trace, and then called his brother to come pick him up since his motorcycle was damaged during the crash. When it was dark enough, James returned with the truck to the cornfield and loaded Sierra onto his truck before taking her to the barn on his property. It was in the barn that he dressed her up in the adult diaper and gagged her with the dog toy. When James eventually realized that Sierra had died, he loaded her into the truck again and drove to the cornfield on Country Road 7, about 12 miles from his property, and buried her in a shallow grave. 
In March 2018, James Worley finally went to trial for the abduction and murder of Sierra Joggin. The prosecution team, led by Fulton County Prosecutor Scott Hasselman, presented the court and jury with this theory. Prosecutors backed up their theory with physical evidence, recorded interviews with James, and phone data. They simply asked the jury to follow the trail of evidence. James's defense attorney, Merle Detch, argued that the prosecution's theory and evidence was weak. Detch told the court that James didn't know or meet Sierra, and the only reason items belonging to James were found at the crime scene was because he'd stopped there after his motorcycle had stalled. As to why there was women's lingerie and a makeshift dungeon found in his barn, Detch explained that James was interested in starting his own adult film business. Over the next four weeks, the jury heard testimony from witnesses called in by both the prosecution and defense. These included taped interviews with James' sister, who alluded to the possibility that he may have been responsible for three other disappearances from the 1980s to the early 2000s. Robin Gardner, James's first known victim, also gave the court a chilling account of her attempted abduction in July of 1990. On March 27, 2018, the jury deliberated for six hours before returning with a verdict. James Worley was found guilty on all charges and, on the recommendation of the jury, was sentenced to death. The court orders that James D. Worley is hereby sentenced to death for the aggravated murder of C.R. Jaguar. The court orders that the execution date of James D. Worley be set for June 3, 2019 to be carried out by the appropriate authorities. The execution date shall be subject to further order by a court of competent jurisdiction. Defendant James D. Worley shall be remanded to the appropriate Ohio prison institution to be held on death row pending his execution. At his sentencing, James continued to profess his innocence and made several remarks about Sierra that caused her family members and friends to excuse themselves from the courtroom. Their hearts are wounded and they always will be. But if you believe like I, I believe that Sierra goes on. She may have been murdered and victimized, but she goes on. Over the years, James made several attempts to have his death sentence overturned. However, all the appeals have failed to date, and James's execution date is set for May 20th, 2025. He remains on death row at the Chillicothe Correctional Institute in Ohio. Sierra's death was devastating to her family, but in the wake of the devastation, there remains a ray of hope. The Sierra Joggin Memorial Scholarship Fund was founded in February of 2021 to assist graduates of Evergreen High School who showed initiative by being part of organizations and participating in varsity sports, but struggled to fund any further education. In July of 2018, James Worley's property was awarded to Sierra's mother as part of a civil suit settlement. The main barn was demolished by the family, and in August 2020, the Fulton County Sheriff's Department and the FBI sought permission from the Sierra family to excavate the property. They believe that evidence could be found relating to other crimes committed by James Worley. To date, nothing has been discovered. On March 20, 2019, Sierra's law was passed. Sierra's law established a violent offender database maintained by Ohio BCI, available to law enforcement. 19 investigates found you, the public, can't see the entire database yourself, but you can go to Sheriff's office and request the name, picture, crimes, and address of violent offenders who live near you. Our case today showed us a disturbing side of human nature. An innocent life full of possibilities taken away in such a violent manner by a person driven by beastly desires. However, in death, Sierra may have helped change the future for many other vulnerable people with the passing of the new bill. On the fateful evening of September 2nd, 2010, 24-year-old Michelle O'Connell had promised to pick up her daughter, 4-year-old Alexis, from her sister's home in St. Augustine, Florida. But as the night unfolded, Michelle never arrived. Michelle had everything she could wish for, a daughter she adored, a dream job she enjoyed, and family and friends who loved her. 
It therefore came as a shock to her family when they received a call from law enforcement stating she'd killed herself. But within months of the incident, new sides of the story began to emerge, casting a shadow over the entire investigation. Why would a woman with a promising life ahead of her decide to cut it short? Would her family finally get closure for Michelle's suspicious death? Michelle O'Connell, whose family is left seeking answers 13 years after the St. John County Police ruled her death a suicide. Situated on the Atlantic coast of northeastern Florida, St. Augustine is the seat of St. John's County. The city was founded by Spanish explorers about 500 years ago. It boasts of unique Spanish colonial architecture and a rich heritage. The combination of history and coastal landscapes makes St. Augustine one of the most sought-after vacation spots in Florida. As of 2020, St. Augustine has a population of over 14,000 and a fairly high violent crime rate of 542 per 100,000 residents. The city is largely made up of middle-class residents, with 17% living below the poverty line. This was the city that was Michelle O'Connell's home. Michelle O'Connell was born on October 6, 1985, to a single mother, Patty O'Connell, who lived with five other children, Scott, Sean, Justin, Jennifer, and Christine. The family of seven shared a tight apartment in St. Augustine as Patty single-handedly cared for the children. As a teenager, Michelle briefly battled depression and anger issues. However, her personality bloomed as she became an adult. Michelle was fun-loving, athletic, outgoing, and took on several daring hobbies like skydiving. She was also very close to her siblings. At the age of 20, Michelle gave birth to her daughter, Alexis, fondly called Lexi. Unfortunately, Lexi's father wasn't present in their lives. Now a single mother herself, Michelle threw all her energy into caring for her child, taking on multiple jobs. A couple of years later, she finally got her dream job, a full-time position at a local daycare center. The job provided her health insurance and allowed her to take Lexi to work, a welcome relief after years of struggle. With the newfound stability of the job, Michelle finally had time for romance again. Soon, Officer Jeremy Banks became a constant feature in her life. 23-year-old Jeremy worked with her brother Scott at the St. John's County Police Department. Michelle and Jeremy grew closer after months of dating, and in 2010, Michelle moved into his house with her daughter. While they seemed like a beautiful couple on the surface, the reality was far from rosy. According to Michelle's family, their relationship was plagued with disagreements, leading to shouting matches and physical fights. However, Michelle refused to report the abuse to prevent Jeremy from facing problems at work. Unfortunately, Michelle never lived to tell her side of the story. On the evening of September 2nd, 2010, Michelle and Jeremy joined fellow revelers in the St. Augustine Amphitheater for a Paramore concert. Michelle's sister Christine had agreed to look after Alexis so the couple could go out and have fun. But what unfolded after that night of partying was far from fun. At 11.20 p.m., Jeremy made a frantic emergency call to report a shooting in his home. 911. Hey! Uh, please get something to my house. It's 4700 truck, please. What's going on? Please, my girlfriend, I think she just shot herself in blood everywhere, please. First responders arrived to find the front door open. They entered the house and made their way through the kitchen to the room where Michelle was lying on the floor, bleeding. Jeremy's service gun, with its tactical light on, lay next to Michelle's left hand. Jeremy was found crouching by the bathroom door and clutching his phone with an unmistakable whiff of alcohol on his breath. Michelle had suffered a gunshot wound to her mouth. The officers also found another bullet lodged in the carpet just below Michelle's right arm. The shell casings of the two bullets were found in a corner of the room. Paramedics arrived shortly after and declared that Michelle was dead. The police searched Michelle's bag, which was found in the room, to establish her identity. Inside it, they discovered two empty prescription bottles for antidepressant medication labeled with Jeremy's name. Interestingly, some of the missing pills from the prescription bottles were found in the front pocket of Michelle's jeans. Another key observation by first responders was that Jeremy did not seem sad. Instead, he looked very angry. When interrogated at the scene, his voice was noticeably bland as he described the incident. 
Jeremy said they'd been arguing throughout their drive back home and Michelle had declared her intention to pack her belongings and move out. According to him, Michelle had wanted to end their relationship, but he'd raised no objections. All right, this is Detective Himes. It is officially September 3rd at 1.23 in the morning. You were outside in the yard driveway? My motorcycle was in the garage. I was okay. sitting on it with my head down. But, uh... I heard it pop and I knew exactly what it was and I ran inside, I started screaming her name and the bedroom door was locked and I screamed her name again I heard it go off again for the second time. On getting home, Jeremy claimed that they'd cooled off from their intense shouting match. He was sitting on his motorcycle in the garage when he heard the distinct pop of his gun from inside the house. He heard a second shot as he ran inside and yelled Michelle's name. He had to kick down the door to get to Michelle and was met by the disturbing sight of his girlfriend lying on the carpet with a gunshot wound to her mouth. Cops are trained to treat every death as a homicide unless proven otherwise. However, even before formal investigations began, the St. John's County police officers, who were also colleagues of Jeremy, accepted his account of events. They concluded that Michelle had taken her own life. I didn't have any suspicions that it was anything other than suicide. It, I think that's what we were all kind of discussing, uh, but just making sure that we covered our bases. It appeared she had committed suicide. After Michelle's body was taken away from the scene, an autopsy was conducted by St. John's County Chief Medical Officer Dr. Frederick Hoban. His findings show that while Michelle had a significant amount of alcohol in her system, there was no trace of the antidepressant pills. A bruise was found over her right eyelid, which she attributed to ejected shell casings from the gun. Her hands were laced with gunshot residue, but showed no signs of defensive wounds. Based on these findings, Dr. Hoban concluded that Michelle's cause of death was her taking her own life. Jeremy faced minimal interrogation despite being Michelle's estranged partner and the only person at the crime scene. A very small amount of gun residue was found on his hands, but this was attributed to him having rushed into the room immediately after the gun was fired. Also, a tiny amount of blood was found on the inside of the shirt he was wearing that night, but he was neither duly interrogated about it, nor did he explain how the blood came to be on his clothes. With several questions still burdening their hearts, the O'Connells laid Michelle to rest one week after her death. Her graveside funeral service was held at the San Lorenzo Cemetery in St. Augustine on September 9, 2010. On September 14, 2010, two weeks after Michelle's death, Jeremy was invited for another interview, which was long overdue according to standard practice. Noticeably, he was not treated as a suspect in any form. In the footage of the interview, he was seen involved in a light-hearted chat with the officer interrogating him and even chuckled several times. His demeanor was uncharacteristic of a man who had just lost a partner. Comfy spinny chair, not the suspect. <laughs> Michelle's telephone records showed that she'd sent concerning texts to her sister, Christine, throughout the evening before her death. Michelle had asked Christine, who was babysitting Alexis that night, to promise her that her daughter would be well taken care of no matter what happened. Michelle's last text of the night was sent to her brother, Scott, at 10.06 p.m., about one hour before she was declared dead. She wrote in the message, Lexi, never forget. Desperate for an update regarding the snail paste investigation, the O'Connell siblings paid the sheriff's office a visit several weeks after Michelle died. Christine requested to submit a statement about the domestic violence that Michelle faced during her relationship with Jeremy. Surprisingly, she was told that the intended testimony would not matter as it was merely hearsay. The siblings also met Lieutenant Charles Bradley, who immediately stood to the defense of his colleague and dismissed the family's so-called conspiracies about Jeremy he advised them to accept the fact that their sister had taken her own life, as concluded by the autopsy, and proved further by the strange text Michelle had sent her siblings that fateful night. Hopefully this will give you some closure as to, to what occurred that night. All indications are that she was contemplating suicide based on her text. I asked the night that Michelle died, I said, am I allowed to submit a statement because she told me a lot of things about and I'm just going to spell it out for anyone to hear. Domestic violence. She came to my house. She said, I'm leaving. I'm scared. Am I allowed to submit an affidavit just to testify to what she said? And he said, no, none of that is, it's all I here. Felt. If this I was the sheriff's daughter, it'd be much different. 
What You're a lieutenant of this agency. Stand up and answer our questions. Ease up, bro. You know, I'm doing the very best I can, guys, to, to show y'all what happened. And I feel like this is a damn inquisition on me. It's not against you. I haven't you. done anything wrong, guys. I, I, Sheriff's I, office has a bit. <laughs> And I can, I can feel at this table that there is a massive conspiracy theory, and there is not one, guys. Can I interject? What conspiracy theory are you talking about? Right. That You're Jeremy to... is the murderer of Michelle. Okay, I keep I keep getting that, and I've been getting that over the last you know several weeks. So what we need to do, guys, is we need to we need to sit down. And we need to just this is what it is, but I mean, and this is what happened. And, you know. The distraught family returned home unable to grieve as they were yet to gain real closure about Michelle's death. The O'Connells did not keep calm about the death of Michelle and took to the media to canvas for public outrage. Months after the case was closed, Sheriff David Shore had to call for an independent state inquiry by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in January 2011. A seasoned investigator, Rusty Rogers, headed the inquiry and came upon some worrying facts about the initial investigation. Despite being the only other person present at home that evening and being a partner with a strong evidence of conflict, the St. John's County police officers had not treated Jeremy as a prime suspect. The case was never treated as a potential murder either. Michelle's family was not questioned about the state of her life and no neighbors were interrogated about the couple. Detective Rogers came up with a horde of significant evidence in just two weeks of stepping into the case. He noted that Michelle had made several commitments prior to the night of her death. She told Christine before going to the concert that she wanted to break up with Jeremy and start her life anew. She had plans to meet her friend, Mendy, later that same night. She'd won a promotion at her job and was thrilled about it and was also supposed to start CPR training two days later. These prospects made the idea of her taking her own life unreasonable in Michelle's case. Rogers combed the neighborhood and found two key witnesses whose accounts of that night were so crucial they were made to take a polygraph test. Two women from different houses on the street reported they'd heard screams for help from Banks' home on the night of September 2nd, 2010. Um, we heard a woman yell for help and then we heard a gunshot and then there was another yell for help, and then another gunshot. Both witnesses passed the polygraph tests. Based on this new evidence, the medical officer, Dr. Hoban, privately changed the conclusion of the autopsy to homicide. He did this unofficially, only informing the state attorney of his move. Detective Rogers also consulted a crime scene reconstructionist, Jerry Findlay, whose findings challenged the initial investigation. Findlay noted that it was unlikely that Michelle could have removed Jeremy's gun from the retention holster as it was a very technical process. He also rejected Dr. Hoban's conclusion that the bruise above Michelle's eye was caused by the ejected shell. Most importantly, based on the position where the shell casings were found relative to Michelle's body, Findlay concluded that the shooter was definitely left-handed while Michelle had been right-handed. The only person who was left-handed in the house was Jeremy. A fresh round of forensic investigation raised further suspicions. There was no blood on Jeremy's gun, despite being in contact with Michelle's body at the moment of the shot. Jeremy's fingerprints and DNA were also absent from the service weapon, even though he'd worn the gun earlier in the day. This raised questions about the true nature of the gunshot residue found on his hands that fateful night. When interrogated, Jeremy denied washing his hands or cleaning the gun before the first responders arrived. However, Jeremy confessed that he had read the crime scene report by first responders, violating standard investigative protocols. Detective Rogers then interrogated Jeremy's colleagues from the police department who had arrived at the scene following Michelle's death. One common feature in their interviews was that they'd sent something off with Banks' story but hadn't done any further digging. One officer stated that on walking into the room, he'd thought to himself, this doesn't look good for Jeremy. Another deputy shared doubts about how an untrained person like Michelle could have removed the gun from the holster and also admitted that Jeremy had a terrible temper, especially when he was drunk. A grossly overlooked witness in this case was Michelle's four-year-old toddler, Alexis, who had lived with her mother in Jeremy's house. When Detective Rogers interviewed her, Alexis called Jeremy a bad man who beat her mother with a belt. Rogers submitted the final report of his findings to the state prosecutor in February 2011. 
However, the prosecutor withdrew from the case, citing his close relationship with the sheriff's office. So another prosecutor, Brad King, was invited from a neighboring county. King brought in two medical examiners and both concluded that Michelle's case was not a homicide and that she'd taken her own life. Their theory was that Michelle had held the gun to her mouth upside down before firing the shot. However, experts disputed this theory, stating that in the reverse position, the gun would have to recoil forward to make the shot. This was impossible, as guns only recoil backwards. Nevertheless, the medical examiner, Dr. Hoban, supported this new theory and changed course once again, reverting to the earlier autopsy conclusion of her ending her own life. Prosecutor King also declined to take up the case as a homicide, thereby dashing the hopes of Michelle's family. When the official announcement was made in March 2012, Michelle's family was shocked and outraged. Her brother, Scott, who also worked at the St. John's County Police Department, burst into an angry tirade, which cost him his job. Sheriff Shore also fired back at Rogers, calling his investigation a sham with manufactured evidence. He made a 152-page report where he accused Rogers of several irregularities, which led to the detective being placed on administrative leave. And so, Michelle's case was closed again. In 2013, Michelle's brother Scott O'Connell was rehired by Sheriff Shore. To the shock of the O'Connell family, Scott made up with Jeremy and began to actively dissuade his family from pushing forward with investigations. He even advised them to disregard Detective Rogers' findings. Rather than relent, the remaining O'Connells pursued the case further, starting a petition on April 21, 2014 against the St. John's County Sheriff's Office. The petition garnered support from more than 180,000 signatories, and in October 2014, then-Florida Governor Rick Scott issued an executive order to initiate a fresh investigation into Michelle's death. Around the same time, a new witness came forward and voluntarily submitted a sworn statement, claiming that she'd overheard Jeremy in a bar the night after Michelle's death, saying, that she got what she deserved. Despite high hopes, this reopened investigation ended with the same result. Law enforcement concluded again that Michelle had ended her own life. Michelle's case caught the interest of several people who offered their own services to solve the mystery. One of these people was Dr. William Anderson, a pathologist, who offered to re-examine Michelle's remains without collecting a dime from the O'Connells. Michelle's body was exhumed in 2016, and in the re-examination that followed, Dr. Anderson found an important detail. According to him, Michelle's jawbone had been broken with significant trauma. I discovered the fracture only basically on the second autopsy. So all of those people that were making an assumption this was a suicide were unaware of the existence of the fractured mandible. And that's a different injury pattern, and it creates a whole different scenario in the case. We have external trauma. We have significant trauma unrelated to the wound itself. And that means that someone else was involved. This detail, however, was suspiciously absent in the original and subsequent autopsies carried out by the three medical examiners. The broken mandible contradicted the initial conclusion that there were no defensive wounds on Michelle's body. Despite this groundbreaking discovery, nothing changed. The St. John's County Sheriff's Office stuck to the conclusion that Michelle had killed herself and that their colleague was innocent. Amateur investigator Eli Washtalk was another person who was touched by Michelle's story and passionate about seeking the truth. Eli contacted the O'Connell family and grew close to Michelle's mother, Patty. According to Patty, Eli was convinced he had come close to the truth and had enough evidence to call for a reinvestigation into Michelle's death. However, a dark shadow was looming over Eli. On the night of January 30th, 2019, Eli sent his teenage son to sleep in a neighbor's condominium in their World Gulf Village community in St. Augustine for no clear reason. When Eli's son returned home the next morning, he found his father's room riddled with gunshots and Eli lying on the floor in a pool of blood. Do you need law enforcement or fire rescue? Uh, um, well, I think I just need an ambulance. Okay, what's going on there? Um, got shot. Okay, what makes you think that? 
He's currently laying on the floor with blood around his head. An emergency call was made, but the paramedics declared Eli dead at the scene. Eli had been murdered with a gunshot to the head. Police believe the killer was someone that Eli knew and who had access to his highly secured condo. They also suggested that Eli had knowingly sent his son to the neighbor's place because he had anticipated the incident. The O'Connell family and Eli's family both declared their strong belief that his homicide was connected to the unofficial investigation he was carrying out. However, officials from Putnam County, who were in charge of Eli's case, completely dismissed this theory. Despite having no strong leads, Putnam County officers stated categorically that Eli's death had no connection with Michelle's death. We've, uh, we've looked into that uh, in depth, and we haven't been able to find anything that uh, would connect any of that. Uh, the officer that was involved in that case, the Michelle O'Connell case, didn't even really seem to know who he was or that he was one of the people investigating him. I'm hoping that we can find whoever did this because this crime, it, it was very heinous. It was very up close and personal and um, the person who did this needs to be brought to justice. The O'Connells have gone through the most tumultuous time in the past decade. First was the death of their daughter and sibling, then a disordered investigation where protocols were broken and their suspicions were dismissed. A slight ray of hope emerged with the reinvestigation, but it was also quickly dashed after law enforcement stuck to its verdict that Michelle had died by her own hands. In this case, the St. John's County Sheriff's Office played both defendant and judge. The O'Connells allege that the police department shielded its own from the due process of justice and stuck to a decision based on a faulty process. In 2019, David Shore resigned as the sheriff and got a new job as a head investigator in a Florida law firm. Jeremy Banks still works at the St. John's County Police Department, but he claims his life has been ruined by the baseless allegations of the O'Connell family and that his neighbors regard him as a murderer. Michelle's daughter Alexis, now a teenager, still reels from the grief of losing her mother. Speaking of Alexis's pain, Michelle's friend Sierra Morris told reporters, she has days when she just reaches up to the sky and cries and begs for her mom. For the O'Connells, closure is still far from sight. In an interview, Michelle's mother Patty said that the family hasn't been able to properly grieve because they're still focused on proving that Michelle was murdered. You can't grieve until you get justice, she said. You have to have your justice. And it never goes away. The morning of March 25, 2009 started like any other day for 41-year-old Laverne Parsons, who worked as a physical therapist at a clinic called Healing Hands in Grovetown, Georgia. Laverne had one child, Derek, whom she doted on. That day, she took Derek to school and returned home to pick up some things for work. However, Laverne never reported for work. In fact, her colleagues never heard from her again. What happened to Laverne? Did she get tired of it all and run away? Or was there a darker explanation behind her disappearance? This story takes us to Grovetown, a town in Columbia County, Georgia, where the residents are hospitable and friendly. The town saw a surge in population due to occupation and the construction of multiple housing units, transforming it from a quiet town into a bustling hub. Presently, Grovetown is home to a little over 15,000 people, a significant increase from the 1990 census figure of 3,500. Historically, Grovetown's been a retreat for affluent nearby Augusta residents seeking relief from the city's heat during summers. In terms of safety, Grovetown has an overall crime rate of 9 incidents per 1,000 residents, which aligns with the average crime rate for cities and towns of various sizes across America. This is the town where Laverne K. Parsons lived. Laverne Catherine K. Sanner Parsons was born in Pennsylvania to Arthur and Mabel Sanner on February 11, 1968. Laverne grew up with three brothers, Kenny, Chuck, and Arthur, and three sisters, Elma, Mary, and Olive. Together, they had a loving and supportive upbringing. Growing up in a nurturing home laid the foundations for Laverne's caring nature. From her early years, Laverne showed an extraordinary dedication to her loved ones. After graduating from Laurel Highlands High School in 1987, she married her high school sweetheart, David R. Parsons. 
Not long after, David enrolled in the United States Army. Nevertheless, their marriage grew into a beautiful family with the arrival of their son, Derek. Family was the cornerstone of Laverne's life, and she radiated immense joy and pride in being a dedicated army wife and mother. Her love for her family always took precedence over her own needs. However, what set Laverne apart was her passion for being a baseball mom. It was not just a role for her. It was a deep-rooted enthusiasm and an avenue for active involvement in her son Derek's life. In addition to her role as a mother, Laverne was a cherished member of the Church of Christ. Her faith was an integral part of her life. This faith was a source of strength and comfort for her, allowing her to face life's challenges with resilience. In 2005, the Parsons family moved to Grovetown, Georgia, as David, now a retired military man, pursued a career as a contractor. Laverne continued her life in the new city, adapting seamlessly to her surroundings. She worked at Healing Hands Physical Therapy, a local physical therapy clinic, contributing her skills and compassion to her community. Laverne Parsons and her family lived at 229 Hot Springs and formed a close bond with their neighbors, the Sears family, that lived at 227 Hot Springs. Tennis matches were a regular activity between the two couples, and their sons often enjoyed playing sports like baseball together. Rebecca Sears and her husband Tony were parents to three sons. Additionally, Rebecca had two sons, 19-year-old Christopher and his elder brother Michael from a previous marriage. Rebecca also worked at Healing Hands Physical Therapy with Laverne, so naturally, they built a strong friendship that reflected on both families. Altogether, the families lived as a community. On March 25, 2009, at around 8.45 a.m., handyman Mitchell Cozart came to work at the Parsons home. When he didn't get a reply at the front door, he went to the back door. There, he saw broken glass and, believing there had been a break-in, immediately called 911. Any emergency 911? Yes, I'm over here at uh, 229 um, um, Cold Springs, um, and the back door is broken, and I had come over here to do some work, and, uh, and uh, I just walked around the back because I had some coughing to do, and the... The stuff's broke in. I mean, this back glass is flattered out and everything. Oh, right. I'd like to get the police over here. Okay. I called the owner, but she's not here. Um, and I don't think if, if she's gone. Um, I mean, I, I hollered at the end of the door uh -huh. and I did, get no response. Yeah, I don't want you to go in, honey. All right, I'll get them on over there, honey. Thank, Thank you. you, Papa. The Columbia County Sheriff's Department quickly arrived at the scene. The shattered glass at the back of the house was an immediate indication that something was wrong. Inside, they found evident signs of a break-in. The bedroom's mattress had been overturned and all the drawers pulled out with blood on the walls and floors. They began looking around to get more information. When they reached the garage, they saw Laverne in a pool of her own blood and a bloodied claw hammer and baseball bat nearby. Laverne was badly beaten, with injuries all over her body. There were clear signs that she'd fought to defend herself. The detectives checked her pulse and discovered that she had a faint heartbeat and they quickly rushed her to the hospital. Unfortunately, she was pronounced dead the next day. The policeman discovered Laverne had been beaten almost to death by a claw hammer in her living room. The blood trail suggested she fled from her assailant into the garage where she was ultimately murdered. At the time of the attack, Laverne's husband David was in California on a business trip. When he received the devastating news, he immediately flew back only to face the heartbreaking decision to take his beloved wife off life support, her injuries proving too extreme. The initial assessment by authorities pointed towards a burglary gone wrong, with Laverne accidentally stumbling upon the intruder. Valuables, including a gold necklace and a watch, were missing from the house. Surprisingly, their neighbor, the Sears, reported a burglary at their home that same day. Their door's glass had been shattered, mirroring the events at the Parsons residence. Thankfully, no one was home during the intrusion, so nobody was harmed, but the interior of the house was ransacked. When the police went to investigate, they found a drop of blood found on the back door. Among those deeply affected by these events was Rebecca Sears, Laverne's friend, neighbor, and colleague. Upon discovering the break-in at her own home and the vicious assault on Laverne, she was understandably worried and upset. Naturally, the police questioned the handyman, Mitchell Cozart, who discovered the break-in. In his statement, Mitchell told the police that he'd noticed a young boy from the neighborhood sitting on a rock across the street from the two houses. Following his description, the boy was later identified as Michael Bowers, the older son of Rebecca Sears. Recognizing the potential significance of this observation, 
the police initiated an inquiry into Michael's involvement. They searched him and requested to inspect the soles of his shoes, and upon examination, they discovered a shard of glass stuck there. The discovery suggested that Michael was either the killer or he was in the vicinity even before the handyman came. Just as the police were preparing to bring him in and possibly search his house, they got another call. Approximately 36 hours after Laverne's tragic murder, her neighbor, Rebecca Sears, made a distressing call to 911 while she was working at Healing Hands Physical Therapy. That's the 911. Somebody came out from behind the trees and he shot me. Do you know where you did it? Uh, uh, my leg. What's the name of the office? It's Healing Hands Physical Therapy. Now, what's the name? Becky Sears. She reported that a man had entered her workplace and shot her in the leg. This man had also threatened her, warning that she'd be shot in the face if he didn't receive money. Now, the detectives had a new suspect, so they made him a priority and directed all their focus from Michael to this shooter. However, detectives were unable to find the man that had shot Rebecca, so they soon began investigating Michael again. This time, however, they found some incriminating information. Following the shooting of Rebecca, the police intensified their investigation into the background of Michael Bowers. They discovered he had a history of criminal activity and was struggling with drug issues. Michael's recent behavior had been so erratic that his mother, Rebecca, had confided in her neighbors that she was reaching her limit with him and would soon kick him out. The case appeared straightforward. Michael had a motive, preventing his mom from kicking him out, as well as ample opportunity and incriminating evidence tying him to the crime scene. However, things are not always as they seem. About 48 hours following Laverne's murder, a shocking and surprising event that would make you question everything happened. An inmate named Jerry Jacobs, who happened to be Rebecca's brother, contacted the police. She was crying, and she had asked me if I knew of anyone, or if I knew a way that we could do this to kill Kay and make it look like an accident. You know, she's like, no. She's like, I really want to do it. She said, can we do this? And I'm like, no, we can't. She just stopped calling me altogether. But she would call Christopher almost every night. Jerry suggested that his sister might have been involved in Laverne's murder. According to Jerry, Rebecca had visited him before Laverne's murder and confessed to having an affair with David Parsons, Laverne's husband. She'd even asked Jerry if he knew someone who could eliminate Laverne and make it look like an accident. However, Jerry wisely declined and didn't get involved. Detectives were shocked by this new information. The disclosure raised suspicions about David Parsons, who was unaware that his affair had been revealed. On March 27, 2009, detectives interviewed David. Uh, Mary and I started talking, and then I started to uh, see stuff. We talked about being together again. Yeah, talked about your future together. I didn't want to take Kay out of the equation for that. Yeah. Talked for a while about what was going on, and got involved. You're not going to do your son any good by withholding any information going to prison. So what? There's some kind of involvement in this with my wife? If there is any. <laughs> Check everything you want to check, everywhere you want to check. Never once there's been any kind of insinuation, not even insinuating that I would ever want anything to happen to her. So I was thinking, so far from the last thing I want to take her the only way from us. <laughs> she never did anything wrong to anybody, not even one stupid thing. You know, it's her life and her life with my son. He readily admitted to having an affair with Rebecca, which began the previous summer. According to David, Rebecca had initiated the affair citing that her poor performance in tennis was because she was distracted by him. They started exchanging messages and calls, and Rebecca even provided David with a separate cell phone. They met for intimate encounters at their respective homes, and it became clear that Rebecca had become fixated on David. Ultimately, Rebecca decided to confess the affair to her husband, Tony. David, recognizing the breach of boundaries, ended the affair. He noted that Rebecca did not take the breakup well. After obtaining David's phone records, investigators confronted him about his conversation with Rebecca the night before the murder, during which they professed their love for each other and had phone sex. Despite this, David vehemently denied any involvement in his wife's murder. He expressed complete surprise and stated that he had no idea that Rebecca could be capable of such a horrible act. David was eventually cleared as the suspect in the case. David also revealed that Rebecca's other son, Christopher, was aware of the affair. She had confided in him about both the affair and the issues in her marriage to Tony. Jerry, Rebecca's brother who was in prison, also provided additional information to authorities, 
He told them that Rebecca and Christopher had an intriguing mother-son relationship and would often have nightly conversations about various matters. Following this new information, Michael Bowers was ruled out as a suspect and the police shifted their focus to Christopher. He appeared willing to go to great lengths to please Rebecca, who rewarded him with money and cars in exchange for various tasks. Additionally, Rebecca supplied Christopher with drugs like oxycodone, oxycontin, and Xanax, which notably affected his behavior. After a few hours, the police brought in Christopher and Rebecca for questioning. During questioning, Christopher was very uncooperative and immediately asked for a lawyer. I want to put to a lawyer right now. Meanwhile, Rebecca confessed to manipulating Christopher into committing the crime. According to Rebecca, a few hours before the murder, she picked up Christopher from his house and brought him to hers. He hid in a spare bedroom while she left with their children. Laverne, too, left her home to take Derek to school. Seizing the opportunity, Christopher jumped the fence to Laverne's house, broke in, and lay in wait for her. When she returned, he viciously attacked her immediately and then staged the burglary. He then fled into the woods using a pre-packed backpack. It became evident that this assault was premeditated, a result of planning between Christopher and Rebecca. Later, when Rebecca picked Christopher up, she noticed blood on his face, and Christopher confirmed that he'd taken care of everything. Eventually, Christopher confessed to viciously assaulting Laverne. But that wasn't all. Rebecca also revealed that the attack at her on her workplace was staged to divert police attention away from them. The plan was for Christopher to threaten Rebecca with a gun. However, events took a tragic turn when he accidentally pulled the trigger, shooting his mom in the leg. Consequently, they were both arrested and charged with murder. Both Christopher and Rebecca entered not guilty pleas and were facing the death penalty. The prosecution stated that Rebecca was the mastermind behind the murder and that she had planned it because she wanted David to herself. Columbia County Sheriff's Captain Steve Morris noted that this was one of the saddest if not the saddest case we've investigated in a long, long time. During the proceedings, Rebecca was emotional and would often shed tears. At a particular moment, she and her son blew kisses to each other. At another instant, she mouthed, I love you. Rebecca later took a plea agreement. To avoid the death penalty, she provided information to aid their case. In May of 2012, Rebecca shared critical information with her attorney and the prosecution. She disclosed the location of the bloody clothing worn by Christopher during the crime. The clothing was hidden in her mother's attic. This clothing held DNA evidence linking both Christopher and Laverne to the crime scene. Faced with this evidence, Christopher changed his plea to guilty for the murder. Eventually, Rebecca Sears pleaded guilty to murder, armed robbery, and burglary in May of 2012. Subsequently, the death penalty was removed as an option for both of them. Superior Court Judge Cheryl B. Jolly sentenced both mother and son to life sentences without the possibility of parole for Laverne's murder, alongside a life sentence for armed robbery and an additional 20 years for burglary, all to be served consecutively. According to prison records, Rebecca is currently incarcerated at the Lee Arendale State Prison in Alto, Georgia. Laverne Parsons was laid to rest at the Sylvian Heights Cemetery in Pennsylvania. Her husband, David, made no comments after Rebecca and her son were convicted. For Tony Sears, Rebecca's husband, the whole ordeal has been an unending nightmare, a whirlwind that has shattered his family's life. It's tough, real tough. All of us miss her so much. My whole world's changed, Tony shared. It's terrible. I can't even think about it. I don't even know what to think about it, he continued. On a personal level, Tony doubted Christopher's involvement. Personally, I couldn't see him doing something like that, he affirmed. Renee Alexander, Rebecca's sister, had been a constant presence at the Nashville home, providing support to Tony and his sons. Renee also helped finance his sister and nephew's defense. When asked if she had any doubts about Rebecca's innocence, Renee firmly stated, No doubts whatsoever. I know my sister and I know my nephew. I know the things that they're capable of, and this is not one of them. Regarding the prosecution's claim of an affair, Tony Sears chose not to delve into that topic. I'd rather not talk about that, he replied. So there you have it, the twisted story of Laverne Parsons, which reveals how even the most straightforward cases can have the most stunning twists. In the enchanting landscape of Bremerhaven, Germany, where waves touch the shore and love stories usually find their happily ever afters, a sinister mystery unfolded. 
On March 1, 2022, a suitcase washed up on the shores of River Weiser in Germany. Inside was a dismembered body. The body was identified to be of 32-year-old Ekaterina Baumanns. How did this young and spirited woman meet such a tragic fate? And what kind of twisted betrayal was uncovered as police hunted for the truth behind her murder? Nestled along the northern coast of Germany, along River Weiser, Bremerhaven is a captivating port city with a rich heritage of preserved wartime ships and seafaring museums. The place attracts lots of travelers with its unique blend of history and modernity. Life in Bremerhaven is deeply connected to the sea, and a distinct maritime influence can be seen in the cuisine, culture, and even the daily rhythms of this city. Bremerhaven is mostly safe with a relatively low crime rate compared to other large cities in Germany. However, in 2022, the tragic case of Ekaterina Baumann shocked the whole nation and gained global attention. Ekaterina Bolgova was born on May 13, 1989, in her hometown of St. Petersburg in Russia. Even as a young girl, she was smart and intelligent and excelled at school. Her dreams and talents were nurtured by her loving family, especially her mother, Svetlana Bolgova. In 2009, at the age of 20, Ekaterina went on a family holiday to Turkey. This was where her life changed forever when she met Walter Bauman. Walter Bauman was 33 years old when he met Ekaterina in Turkey on a vacation. Born and raised in Kazakhstan, Walter was fluent in Russian, which helped him to get closer to Ekaterina. Despite the 13-year age gap, Walter was able to charm the young woman with his maturity and stability. He was a German citizen and lived with his parents in Bremerhaven, where he worked at the port. Walter was proud of his background, but didn't put much effort into his appearance, while Ekaterina was beautiful and charming. However, despite the differences, the couple fell for each other right away. Even when they returned to their respective countries after the vacation, they maintained a long-distance relationship through the internet and phone calls. In fact, Walter managed to visit Ekaterina a few times in St. Petersburg, which further strengthened their love story. Walter's commitment to Ekaterina's dreams ran deep. Ekaterina was a second-year graduate student at the time, and Walter helped her transition to Hamburg University in Germany, a decision that would change the course of their lives. In 2010, Ekaterina moved continents to embrace her new life in Germany and build a future with Walter. Though miles away from Russia, Ekaterina maintained a strong bond with her family through regular communication, keeping their hearts connected. She continued to build on her previous studies in Russia and pursued a degree in business administration at Hamburg University. Ekaterina found peace by going for runs and practicing yoga. She loved to explore her new home, finding tranquil spots where she could unwind. After a few months in Germany, the couple decided to take a major step forward. In 2010, they got married, and the celebration was a portrayal of pure happiness and extravagance. Walter's friend Alexander, who attended the wedding, would later recall the ceremony as a lavish affair, and Ekaterina was the most beautiful bride he'd ever seen. Ekaterina and Walter exchanged their vows at a lighthouse near Bremerhaven, symbolizing their love as the guiding light to a bright future. Then they hopped on a big white horse-drawn carriage, which was a rare sight in Germany. Their story, at a glance, mirrored a fairy tale. But instead of a lavish castle, the newlyweds made their home in Walter's parents' house, embarking on the journey of a shared family life with the promise of enduring love and devotion. But nobody could have guessed how this so-called fairy tale would have an ugly ending. Fast forward 12 years to 2022. 32-year-old Ekaterina, now the mother of a 5-year-old girl, suddenly cut off all contact with her family in Russia. It was as if she vanished into thin air. Back home in Russia, her mother Svetlana grew increasingly worried after being unable to contact Ekaterina since February 4, 2022. Two days later, she requested for a welfare check from the German police, only to find out that no one knew where she was. A nationwide search went on for weeks, as German officials, along with the canine department of police sniffer dogs, searched for Ekaterina relentlessly. On March 1, 2022, 25 days after Ekaterina's unexplained disappearance, 
a chilling discovery sent shockwaves through Bremerhaven, and soon the entire nation, and even as far as Russia. It all started with a regular passerby strolling along the serene River Vessel when he spotted a peculiar suitcase washed ashore. Curious, he opened the suitcase, but what he found inside would haunt his nightmares. A dismembered body of a woman wrapped in garbage bags with some parts missing. Tragically, it was confirmed that the victim was none other than 32-year-old Ekaterina Bauman. The eerie twist in this grim tale was the suitcase's proximity to the very lighthouse where Ekaterina had celebrated her wedding. It was as though fate had brought this dark secret to light. This horrific turn of events left the community in shock. To process their grief, residents of Bremerhaven created an impromptu memorial, leaving flowers, candles, and heartfelt letters to remember the beautiful young woman who had charmed many with her bright personality. But how did Ekaterina's dreamy life turn into the darkest nightmare? What could be the motive behind such monstrosity? To get the answers, we need to rewind and trace back Ekaterina's life in Germany. Right after the marriage, Ekaterina's life took an unexpected turn as she found herself living with Walter's parents, a situation that quickly turned challenging. Despite her attempts to be a dutiful daughter-in-law, Ekaterina's relationship with Walter's mother, Ludmilla, grew strained. Walter, working at the port, earned a decent income of 4,000 euros monthly. However, his relentless work schedule even included weekends and holidays. He hoarded his earnings and was hesitant to spend. In 2017, when Ekaterina became pregnant, he finally decided to use his savings and purchase a new house to move away from his parents. But the change in residence did little to mend the growing strain. Walter's mother, Ludmilla, was very close to the couple and had significant influence in their lives. Ludmilla worked at the Marine Institute in Bremerhaven. As a working mother, Ludmilla always had the guilt of leaving her only child behind and not spending enough time at home. This led her to overcompensate and love Walter even more. He was Ludmilla's biggest priority. Thus, Ekaterina as a daughter-in-law had great expectations to meet as she was the wife of her only child. Shortly after moving to their new home in 2017, Ekaterina gave birth to their daughter, Victoria. But as their family grew, Walter's behavior towards Ekaterina changed completely. His daughter was his only priority, and he started being controlling and even harsh on Ekaterina. He wouldn't allow her to drive a car or even speak to their daughter in her native language, Russian. These changes confused Ekaterina. She'd hoped for a happy family of three, never imagining Walter's deepening control and resentment. It soon became impossible to even predict his reactions. His temper flared over the slightest issues, sometimes escalating to physical attacks. In late 2019, authorities in Bremerhaven had to intervene due to an incident of violence, but the case was closed when the couple claimed reconciliation. Nonetheless, their relationship continued to deteriorate, marked by bitter arguments in front of their child. Accusations flew, with Ekaterina labeled an unfit mother and Walter perceived as a workaholic with waning interest. Walter began to secretly record their disputes, going so far as to attempt hacking Ekaterina's phone. Meanwhile, Ludmilla's toxic and unwelcome presence continued to loom over their marriage. The constant stress and fear became unbearable for Ekaterina. She was desperate to break free from this nightmare and reclaim her life. After years of being judged and mistreated, Ekaterina finally decided to take a step. In 2020, Ekaterina left Walter, but returned when he promised to change. For the sake of their daughter, Ekaterina gave him one last chance. But his transformation was superficial, marked by gifts and family outings. Walter exhibited an alarming degree of control over their daughter, rarely allowing her out of his sight. He even reduced his work hours to spend more time with her. He harbored a deep fear of Ekaterina returning to Russia with her child. The situation deteriorated as Ekaterina discovered her documents had been hidden by Walter. After a heated argument, she sought police intervention and Child Protective Services got involved. In August 2021, fearing for her life, Ekaterina turned to a woman's crisis shelter, sparking a custody dispute. 
Can you imagine being in Ekaterina's position, facing these challenges while trying to ensure your child's safety? Given the severity of the situation, social services considered placing five-year-old Victoria in foster care under the Youth Affairs Services. Ekaterina agreed, but Walter and his mother objected fiercely. Finally, a shared custody arrangement was worked out, with Victoria alternating between living with her father and staying at the woman's shelter with her mother. Due to accommodation issues at the shelter, Ekaterina had to come back home for a few days to care for her daughter. But her desire to return to Russia intensified as days passed. Ekaterina had a new reason to want to move to Russia. She'd met a Russian pilot online and communicated with him daily, seeking his help. She felt bolstered by his support and affection. She even met him in St. Petersburg in January 2022 when visiting her family. But two weeks after returning to Germany on February 4, 2022, all of Ekaterina's communications abruptly stopped, leaving her family and new lover in the dark. In the weeks after Ekaterina was reported missing and before the suitcase was found, Walter's baffling behavior grabbed the attention of investigators. 45-year-old Walter seemed unfazed and unconcerned that his wife was missing. While worried citizens distributed flyers throughout the city looking for Ekaterina, her husband was busy deep cleaning his house and completing renovations. The surveillance footage from their home at the time of Ekaterina's disappearance had mysteriously vanished. Walter seemed utterly focused on gaining sole guardianship of their daughter, raising suspicion. The relentless search for Ekaterina continued, but Walter remained aloof. He claimed that Ekaterina had left by her own choice, but it seemed unlikely that a young mother would abandon her child and vanish without a trace in a foreign land. An interview with Ekaterina's mother, Svetlana, lent further weight to suspicions. Svetlana revealed details of the troubled marriage marked by isolation, control, document confiscation, and violence. She even claimed emphatically that she feared for her daughter's safety. The discovery of the suitcase was fortunate for the investigation, preventing Ekaterina's remains from being lost in the North Sea. But at the same time, it was devastating for Ekaterina's parents in Russia, shattering hopes of a happy resolution. Forensic examination revealed that Ekaterina had died due to strangulation. Time of death was deemed to be around the same time she disappeared on February 4, 2022. Her stomach content showed traces of sedatives and alcohol and indicated she was killed a couple of hours after dinner. The use of a sharp tool, like a saw, was suspected in her body's dismemberment. Walter Bauman became the primary and sole suspect in Ekaterina's murder following Svetlana's revelations. As police thoroughly searched the family home, significant evidence emerged. They found single-use gloves, foil, adhesive tapes, large quantities of garbage bags, and cleaning liquids. Canisters containing acetic acid solvents and bleach, suitcase keys, and Ekaterina's pink scarf were found in the garage. A bottle of the same sedative that was found in Ekaterina's stomach was found at the Bauman residence. More importantly, blood traces were discovered in various locations, including the garage, which Walter had attempted to clean. Blood was found under shelves, on the floor, on the stairs, and in carpet seams. Even Walter's car had traces of blood, despite extensive cleaning. Experts from the Institute of Forensic Medicine confirmed all the blood samples matched Ekaterina's blood type. Few of Ekaterina's personal items remained at the home. Most of her clothes had been discarded. Her wedding photo was hidden behind the piano. The white jacket she wore in her last selfie was discovered in a trash container at Ludmilla Bauman's workplace. Ekaterina's phone record showed her last connection to the network on the evening of February 4th, 2022. She made a video call to her new love interest at 8.25 p.m. and appeared in good spirits, promising to call again after putting her child to bed. However, she never made that promised call. That fateful evening, the family had dinner together, including tuna, halibut, mashed potatoes and olives, with Ekaterina drinking one glass of wine. This matched the autopsy report of stomach contents of Ekaterina's final meal. Walter's actions on the morning of February 5, 2022 also raised suspicion. He was seen briefly opening his car at 7.22 a.m. that morning, followed by the car leaving at 10.20 a.m. and returning at 4.49 p.m. Police tracked his actions with the help of CCTV footage. 
Three days after her disappearance, Walter had called Ekaterina's phone, likely to establish an alibi. He sent messages asking her whereabouts. Unusually, communication between Walter and his mother Ludmilla had ceased after February 4th. In mid-February, Walter had his car extensively cleaned at an auto service. All circumstantial evidence and motives directly pointed at Walter, and police believed they had a watertight case against him. However, during the trial, more cryptic details and twists came to the surface. Walter Baumann was arrested on March 2, 2022, right after Ekaterina's body was found on March 1st. He was arrested on charges of first-degree murder. Based on the reports of the investigation and autopsy, the trial was held on August 26, 2022. The prosecutor alleged that Walter had drugged his wife's drink with sedatives and strangled her while she slept. Walter had premeditated plans for disposing of her body. The motive, as suggested by the prosecution, included his fear of losing custody of their daughter in a divorce and financial concerns around child support payments. Walter's phone and computer, which were confiscated by the police, revealed crucial information. Between December 2021 and February 2022, Walter had made a series of troubling internet searches, including inquiries about evading punishment for murder, the use of acid to dissolve flesh, and methods to read others' WhatsApp chats. These searches, totaling around 500, strongly indicated premeditation. On the day Ekaterina disappeared, Walter had made not one, but two online searches for electric shockers. Forensic experts discovered evidence of electrocution on Ekaterina's body, suggesting that Walter had used the shocker to check if she was alive or not. In court, Walter wore his wedding ring and declared himself a widower. He remained silent and unresponsive to the charges against him and occasionally plugged his ears during witness testimonies as if dissociating himself from the proceedings. As strong evidence against Walter piled up, an unexpected event surprised the jury, prosecutors, and even the defense attorney. Walter's mother, Ludmilla Baumann, confessed to taking Ekaterina's life. Explaining that she'd visited the couple's house that fateful evening and found Ekaterina asleep on the couch. When trying to wake her, a confrontation ensued. According to Ludmilla, she'd strangled her son's wife during the fight. She expressed regret, stating, I loved Ekaterina as a daughter. I didn't want this. Ludmilla wrote two letters to the court admitting her guilt and asserting her son's innocence. However, the prosecution sensed that Ludmilla's confession might be triggered by her immense love for her son. Even the court didn't accept her testimony, as all evidence pointed to Walter. Ludmilla's phone pedometer records showed she was not present at the time of the murder, but had arrived later that night. However, Ludmilla did prove her participation in the crime by guiding police to the location of some of Ekaterina's missing body parts. This suggested she'd acted as an accomplice, even if she didn't directly participate in the crime. She had helped Walter clean the house and cover up evidence. But much to everyone's shock, Ludmilla was neither arrested nor charged with any crime, raising questions about the German legal system's handling of the case. In one of his final court appearances, Walter finally broke his silence and read aloud his written notes, reflecting on his life in Kazakhstan and his love for Ekaterina. His primary message was, I always loved Ekaterina and our daughter, but her emotional burnout and psychological struggles caused many disputes. Walter shifted blame to his mother, accusing her of betrayal and manipulation. He appealed to the judge, pleading that his daughter had already lost her mother and she must not lose her father too. On May 23, 2023, Walter Baumann received a life sentence, with German law allowing the possibility of parole after 15 years. The case of Ludmilla Baumann remains open, leaving the possibility that she may be charged as an accomplice, although no such charges have been filed so far. Ekaterina's ashes were laid to rest in her hometown of St. Petersburg. Her daughter, Victoria, who was just six years old at the time of the verdict, is growing up in foster care in Germany. Ekaterina's mother, Svetlana Bolgova, is still fighting for her granddaughter's custody, but as per German laws, she's not allowed to even contact her through phone calls. Adding to Svetlana's despair, the Russia-Ukrainian war has made it difficult for her to get a visa for Europe.
But she continues to fight for her rights to meet her grandchild even amid hopelessness. On April 25, 2005, Tasha Lamkin arrived at the David Motel in Shreveport, Louisiana with her cousin, Tanya Douglas. Both Tasha and Tanya loved traveling and had rented a car from Houston, Texas to Shreveport, Louisiana. They reached the motel by 11 p.m., and although they were hungry, they were even more exhausted, so they decided to go to bed. But by 3 a.m., Tasha couldn't bear the hunger anymore and set out to find something to eat. Tragically, she never made it back to the room. What happened to Tasha? Did she get lost in a new city? Or was there a more disturbing reason behind her disappearance? Today's story takes us to 2005 Houston. It's the fourth most populous city in the United States, trailing behind New York City, Los Angeles, and Chicago. As of 2022, Houston boasted a population of approximately 2.3 million residents. The city is the most diverse metropolitan area in Texas and is often characterized as the most racially and ethnically diverse major city in the United States. Houston is also home to many cultural institutions and exhibits that collectively draw over 7 million visitors annually to what's known as the Museum District. In 2005, Texas reported a crime rate of 4,857.1 crimes per 100,000 population. This marked a 3.5% decrease from the previous year, based on the 2005 Texas population of approximately 22 million. This is the city where Tasha Lampkin grew up. Tasha Marie Lampkin was born in Houston, Texas on January 23, 1975 to Betty Lampkin. She was a remarkable soul with a unique path in life. Growing up, Tasha's family faced financial challenges, but she possessed an innate talent and a desire for creativity. She taught herself how to sew, a skill that would become a defining part of her identity. Tasha didn't just make clothes, she made unique designs. In her high school years, life took an unexpected turn when Tasha became a mother. Her son became the center of her universe and she was determined to provide him with everything she might have missed during her own upbringing. This unwavering love for children led her to discover her calling. Tasha loved kids, and she embarked on a journey to create a haven for them. Tasha's dream came to life when she opened a daycare. It wasn't just a business. It was an extension of her nurturing nature and love for children. She dedicated her time to caring for them. Her daycare became a place of laughter and endless affection. Tasha Lampkin was more than her occupation. She symbolized determination. It was this love that endured Tasha to her cousin, Tanya Douglas. Tasha Lampkin and her cousin, Tanya Douglas, shared a special bond, often embarking on adventures together. On April 22, 2005, both of them traveled to Shreveport, Louisiana with a rented car. They'd planned to go on adventures and visit family and friends. Tasha and Tanya arrived at the David Motel in Shreveport, Louisiana around 11 p.m. and settled in for the night. On April 23, 2005, around 3 a.m., Tasha decided to go out for a bite to eat. She told Tanya she'd be back soon and left the motel. She drove to a nearby diner, hoping to find something to eat. Little did she know that this seemingly ordinary trip would mark a tragic turn in her life. Tasha left the motel and sadly, she was never seen alive again. Around 6 a.m. on April 23, 2005, Chief Harry L. Lowry of Caddo Parish Fire District 2 responded to a call about a burning car on Coon Road. Firefighters soon reached the scene and battled the flames until they were extinguished. However, in the trunk of the car, they discovered a badly burned body lying on its right side with its head facing towards the driver's compartment. The intense heat had left the body unrecognizable. Following the disturbing scene, the police searched the area and found some disturbing clues. There were shell casings from a 380 semi-automatic handgun on the ground. The license plate had dropped from the car and lay on the ground. Fortunately, it was still readable, allowing the police to trace the car's origins. It was a rental car from Houston. Quickly, the police contacted the rental car company, seeking any information that might shed light on this tragic event. A woman at the company informed them that Tasha and her cousin had rented the car for a journey to Shreveport. She also provided them with a crucial lead, 
the David Motel. She gave them the address of the David Motel where they were staying. With this vital lead in hand, the police headed to the David Motel to seek answers. When the police arrived at the hotel, they located Tanya, Tasha's cousin, and informed her that their rental car had been discovered with a lifeless body inside. Tanya was devastated by the news. They asked her to come with her to identify the body, but the body was burnt beyond recognition and Tanya was unable to identify her cousin, Tasha. However, through a painstaking process of DNA analysis and dental records, the body was conclusively identified as that of Tasha. This confirmation of her identity only deepened the sorrow the family was already feeling. The autopsy report showed that Tasha had smoke in her lungs, which meant that she was still alive when the car was set on fire. The circumstances surrounding her untimely demise raised disturbing questions, and investigators were determined to uncover the truth behind this terrible event. Tanya Douglas gave the police their first lead. She told them that there is a man that Tanya Lampkin talked to every time they came to Shreveport. The man had not been honest. He had a secret family that he hid from Tasha. He lived with a woman and had a child with her. The police wasted no time in interviewing this man. He confessed that he and Tasha were friends. He also confessed that he had a girlfriend and a child. He claimed that he was at home with his girlfriend and child when Tasha was murdered. His girlfriend confirmed his story and he was cleared as a suspect. The police went back to the motel to speak to the employees who worked the night shift. The motel had security cameras that pointed at the parking lot. The cameras showed Tasha's car leaving and coming back to the motel parking lot followed by a red car. A photograph of this red car was shared with the public through the media. A concerned woman, Mrs. Stafford, reached out to the police, certain that the car in question belonged to her daughter, Laquetta Stafford. She'd recognized specific damage on the vehicle. The car was subsequently traced to a local apartment complex. The car's owner explained to the police that she'd spent the night with a friend. While with her friends, she'd allowed her friend's brother, Dwight Bacon, temporary use of her car. However, Dwight had exceeded the agreed-upon time frame for returning the vehicle. Investigators were optimistic about this clue and quickly set out to find as much information as possible about Dwight Bacon and whether or not he was responsible for the horrible crime they witnessed. Detectives successfully located Dwight and wasted no time in bringing him to the station. There, they presented him with the compelling surveillance footage of the red car tailing Tasha. In a predictable move, Dwight denied any involvement with the motel or knowledge of Tasha. He stuck to his story, claiming to have been alone in the car all night. However, the police remained convinced that there was more to the story. Fortunately, Dwight's family cooperated with investigators and presented a crucial lead. They informed the detectives that Dwight had connections with a man named Brandon Davis, a man with a violent criminal record. This revelation heightened the police's suspicions further. Despite repeated denials of involvement in Tasha's tragic fate, detectives decided to take a more aggressive approach. They formed a task force to locate Brandon Davis. After five hours, they successfully apprehended him and brought him in for questioning. Brandon, much like Dwight, refused to cooperate and vehemently denied any wrongdoing in Tasha's case. The detectives didn't believe them. Determined to unearth the truth, they secured search warrants for both Brandon and Dwight's apartments. In Dwight's residence, a crucial discovery was made. A 380 semi-automatic was hidden in his closet. This firearm was promptly sent to the crime lab for analysis. The gun positively matched the one responsible for firing the shell casings discovered at the crime scene. Eventually, under the pressure of mounting evidence, Dwight cracked. He admitted to abducting Tasha from the motel. Dwight and Brandon wanted to steal a car that night. Unfortunately, they chose Tasha as their victim. Dwight said that Brandon pointed a gun at Tasha. They made her get in the rental car and drove both cars from the motel. They also sexually assaulted Tasha and robbed her at gunpoint. To cover their tracks, Brandon decided to set the car on fire. He fired shots into the car's fuel tank to intensify the fire. Throughout the ordeal, Tasha pleaded for her life, but her pleas fell on deaf ears. Abandoning her in the rental car, they fled in the red vehicle, leaving Tasha in the fire. When confronted with the damning evidence, Brandon told the police to take him to jail. 
With overwhelming evidence and both men's admissions, they were charged with murder. On April 22, 2008, the murder trials of Brandon Davis and Dwight Bacon began in Caddo Parish, Louisiana after an extensive jury selection process lasting over a week. Dwight and Brandon faced separate trials. Dwight Bacon opted for a plea deal to avoid the death penalty. He admitted guilt for second-degree murder in exchange for the removal of the death penalty as a sentencing option. Consequently, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. In contrast, when Brandon stood trial, he pleaded not guilty to the charges. The prosecution then called on ex-convict Jarrett Ardwan, who had been incarcerated with Brandon for eight months. Ardwan testified that Brandon had shared details of the murder with him, providing a disturbing account for the court to hear. Unsurprisingly, Brandon was found guilty of first-degree murder. Although the jury couldn't reach an agreement on the death penalty, Brandon received a life sentence without the possibility of parole in 2008. However, he appealed his sentence, and the appeal was heard by Judges Pietras, Drew, and Moore of the Louisiana Appellate Court. Michael H. Idoyaga of the Louisiana Appellate Project represented Brandon, while Charles Rex Scott II, the district attorney, along with Suzanne Morlock-Owen, William Edwards, and Dew Thompson, the assistant district attorneys, represented the state as the prosecutors. Brandon Davis, through his attorney, appealed his conviction and sentence, claiming that there was not enough evidence to prove that he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There was no physical evidence that linked him to Tasha Lampkin or her murder. The motel surveillance video was unclear and unreliable. Laquetta Stafford's testimony was biased and contradicted by other witnesses. Dwight Bacon's confession and testimony were coerced and self-serving. The state failed to prove his intent or specific intent to kill Tasha Lampkin. The appellate court reviewed Davis's arguments and rejected them all. The court affirmed his conviction and sentence. The court concluded that Davis was a principal to the murder of Tasha Lampkin and that he acted together with Dwight Bacon to commit the crime. The court found no error or abuse of discretion in the trial court's decisions or the jury's verdict. Currently, Dwight Bacon is serving a sentence in the Louisiana State Penitentiary, where Brandon Davis is also incarcerated for life. Tasha Lampkin was buried in Houston Memorial Gardens in Texas. Detective Richardson hoped that the national attention garnered by the story would raise awareness about predators who actively seek opportunities to disrupt and harm people's lives. In the meantime, Betty Lampkin, Tasha's mother, became the guardian of Tasha's son, who was just 11 years old at the time of Tasha's tragic murder. Tasha's story serves as a reminder to always be aware of our surroundings. No matter how senseless and violent the crime may be, justice is possible. Tasha's kind and generous spirit touched many lives and lives on in the hearts of all who loved her. The morning of June 29, 2013 started differently for 35-year-old Larry Wells, an assistant manager at the Toys R Us store in Hamburg, New York. He was expecting a child in the next few months and was working extra hard to prepare for his new child. Larry was on the morning shift and logged into work at 3.55 a.m. However, by 5.45 a.m. that morning, a terrified employee called 911 in a panic and reported that a mass shooter had shot an employee at the store. 911 emergency. Help me, help me, please, help. Okay, what's going on? I don't know. He was shot. He was shot? I don't know. At Toys R Us? Is he inside? Yes. Is there anybody else there? Yeah, I have two other guys with me. Oh, my God. Was he there with you? Oh, my God. Okay, what's going on there? Who, who's there with you? Two other staffers. I'm a staffer, and we had a manager. He opened at 4 o'clock. We were on loading trucks. And, and where was the manager when this happened? He's not to let somebody in. Okay. And then another guy just told me the toy store was open, and that's how one of the other staffers got in. Okay, is he alive? I don't know if he's alive. The caller noted that an employee was the only one shot in the store, and the mass shooter fled the scene. However, a headcount revealed that Larry Wells was not with the employees outside the store. What happened to Larry? Was he a victim of the mass shooter? Or was there something else going on? This story takes us to Hamburg, a town in Erie County, New York. The town is named after the city of Hamburg, Germany, and as per the 2020 census, it had a population of around 60,000. 
Hamburg is well known for the Woodlawn Beach State Park, which is along Lake Erie's shore and has been operated by the town since 2011. Additionally, the town is host to the Erie County Fair, which is the third largest county fair in the U.S. The fair's link to the invention of the hamburger sandwich, supposedly created by Frank and Charles Menches at the 1885 Erie County Fair. Hamburg has a lower crime rate compared to many American towns, making it a safer community with a reduced risk of criminal incidents. The chance of being a victim of crime in Hamburg is notably lower than the national average, portraying a secure environment compared to other communities of similar size. This is the town where Larry Wells lived. Larry Wells was born to Lawrence Wells and William Mansfield on September 22, 1977 in Dunkirk, Chautauqua County, New York. Growing up, Larry had a deep passion for education and a love for his family. After graduating from Pine Valley Central School in 1996, Larry pursued his academic aspirations at the State University of New York at Fredonia, where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Elementary Education in 2000. His dedication to learning didn't stop there. In 2004, he furthered his education by obtaining a master's degree from Walden University. Larry wasn't just an educator, he was a sports enthusiast. His love for sports was evident in his enthusiastic support for teams like the Yankees, Bills, Sabres, and Ohio State basketball. But beyond his sports fandom, Larry was an assistant manager at the Hamburg Toys R Us store, a job that was a perfect fit for his wonder and love for toys. He was a big kid who loved toys, and that made his role at the toy store a natural choice. On July 31, 2004, Larry married his high school sweetheart, Jill A. Wells of Bladsdale. Their love story was a testament to dedication and enduring affection. Soon, they had a daughter, Madison, who brought immeasurable joy and purpose to their lives. Larry lived with his family at their Arthur Avenue home in Bladsdale, New York. He was a devoted father and husband. Larry's heart was full of joy and expectations. His life was about to take a significant turn. His wife, Jill, was pregnant again and was expected to give birth in December 2013. At 35 years old, Larry and Jill were both eagerly anticipating the arrival of his second daughter and had already chosen the name Peyton for their baby girl. On the night of June 29, 2013, the local Toys R Us geared up for what was one of its busiest hours, unloading and organizing stock for the upcoming week. Larry Wells clocked in at 3.55 a.m. As the assistant manager of the store, he had to oversee the process. Little did he know the tragic event that lay ahead. That morning, at 4.53 a.m., Anthony Armstrong, another employee, arrived at the store and following the routine for morning shifts, he radioed Larry to be let in. At approximately 5 a.m., Richard Shepard, another employee who was on the morning shift, arrived at the store. He also radioed Larry to be let in, but received no response. Shepard, looking for a way to get in or get Larry's attention, went around the side of the building. To his surprise, he found that one of the doors was open, an unusual oversight at that early hour when exterior doors should be locked. Nevertheless, he went in and logged in for his morning shift. Inside, he began stocking shelves with his co-workers, Isaac and Cindy, each focused on their respective sections. The store was spacious, which often allowed each of the four employees, including their manager Larry, to work independently in different sections for hours without seeing each other. At roughly 5.45 a.m., an alarm blared through the store causing confusion and concern. Cindy had stumbled upon Larry Wells. He was seated in his chair and bleeding heavily from his chest, suggesting a possible gunshot wound. Fearing a potential shooter, the employees quickly evacuated the store. Two minutes later, at 5.47 a.m., a frantic 911 call was made from the Hamburg Toys R Us store. 911 emergency. Okay, what's going on? I don't know. He was shot. He was shot? I don't know. The Toys R Us? Is he inside? Yes. Is there anybody else there? Yes, I have two other guys with me. Oh, my God. Was he there with you? And oh, my God. Okay, what's going on there? Who, who's there with you? Two other stockers. I'm a stocker, and we had a manager. He opened at 4 o'clock. We were on loading trucks. And, and where was the manager when this happened? Not to let somebody in. Okay. And then another guy just told me the toy store was open, and that's how one of the other doctors got in. Okay, is he alive? I don't know if he's alive. The distressed caller reported that upon arriving to unload the store stock, they discovered their manager had been shot. In a rapid and intense response, the Hamburg police, accompanied by a SWAT team, descended upon the Toys R Us store. 
The assailant had already fled the area, leaving behind a bloody scene. Larry Wells, the assistant manager, was found in his chair. The office phone was off the hook and the floor of the room was covered in his blood. The police swiftly established a perimeter and upon entering the room where Larry lay, they assessed his condition. Despite shallow breaths and severe blood loss, Larry was still alive. He was swiftly transported to the hospital. However, amidst the chaos, the police discovered that Larry had actually been stabbed, not shot as initially believed. Tragically, Larry died en route to the hospital. Following Larry's death, the rest of the Toys R Us staff became immediate suspects, and investigators interviewed all of them regarding Larry Wells' murder. Among the four employees present, certain behaviors raised concerns for the investigators. Malet Lloyd appeared nervous and evasive during questioning. Richard Shepard lacked a solid alibi, having arrived late to work. Cindy was the first to discover Larry, and Anthony Armstrong was notably uncooperative, refusing to provide clear answers and behaving strangely. However, a crucial piece of evidence gave investigators confidence that they'd identify the culprit, a 2007 University of Florida Gators cap found on the floor next to Larry. None of the employees present that day claimed ownership of the cap, so the investigators set out to find out who the mystery cap belonged to. Detectives began reviewing surveillance footage in the hopes that they'd find the murderer. While reviewing the footage, investigators spotted a disguised person entering the store at 4.24 a.m. It was obvious that the person was familiar with the layout and security system of the store as he navigated the aisles, skillfully avoiding the cameras. The man entered Larry's office at 4.32 a.m. and the footage abruptly ended at 4.39 a.m. Investigators brought in Bernard Gruxa, the Toys R Us loss prevention expert, to help them analyze the available security footage. Although the office cameras were off, they could see the man in the gator's hat moving throughout the store, his hat visible from above. Meanwhile, the police sent the hat for analysis to see if they could retrieve the killer's DNA. Further scrutiny of the surveillance footage led the police to identify a distinctive gait and bow-legged characteristic of the killer. Not long after, the DNA results came back. Usable DNA was found on the hat, prompting the police to check the DNA against the convicts in their databases, but they found no connection. When they didn't find a match in the existing databases, investigators decided to swab numerous employees and potential suspects for comparison. The detectives thought they'd be able to solve the case quickly until a shocking revelation came. The DNA wasn't a match to any of the employees. They even collected DNA samples from past employees of Hamburg Toys R Us and those connected to Larry, but still, there was no match. The Hamburg Police Department collaborated with the FBI and worked to construct a profile of the killer. The police were aware that they were dealing with a knife-wielding assailant, but this suspect was not in their criminal database. They identified a potential individual recently released from jail, linked to Toys R Us through a car registered to one of its employees and a prior arrest where a large knife was discovered in the vehicle. A specialized team was dispatched to acquire this person's DNA. They tracked him to Buffalo, New York and observed him disposing of a cigarette. The discarded cigarette was promptly collected and sent for testing. However, upon analysis, it was determined that the DNA from the cigarette did not match the DNA found at the crime scene and he was excluded from the list of suspects. The investigation continued for weeks and then months, but there was no progress. Concerns began to grow in Hamburg that the murderer might escape justice. Nevertheless, the detectives continued the investigation, determined to find justice for Larry Wells and closure for his grieving family. Months after the murder, the police reviewed their progress. After a careful review, a critical oversight was realized. They hadn't swamped Bernard Gruxa, the Toys R Us regional loss prevention expert, who'd shown the police the surveillance footage and had claimed that Larry Wells was a friend of his. Although Bernard had been assisting the authorities, he'd always found excuses to avoid the swab. Bernard's alibis and excuses were checked, and they turned out to be false. His most recent excuse was that he had a conference and couldn't make it to provide the DNA sample. However, when the police contacted Bernard's boss to verify this claim, they found that there was no conference. On August 14, 2013, the police finally cornered Bernard at his father's residence, where they observed a Florida Gators bumper sticker on his father's car. This time, Bernard was compelled to provide his DNA sample. Within a few days, the results came back and confirmed a match with the DNA found on the Gator's hat. But, do you know whose DNA was found? And, yeah. 
I saw the hat that morning. You weren't in that That's office. right. That the hat wasn't there. Whatever, guys. Your DNA's off of the hat. Great. It's I didn't do it. It's not great. Because the only way it got I don't there know how it could be. because you had it on when you were there in the office. I don't know what you... I, what, I didn't do but it. Then there's just no way. I understand what you're saying. Is, I did not do it. As bad as whatever you guys have looks or whatever, I didn't do we're, it. We're past the point about who did it. We know who did it. The question is why. You were there. You were in the office with him. This is crazy. I got to get my dog to the appointment at 10 o'clock. But your dogs can wait. I'm not taking the dogs to that party. I have nothing else to say. I didn't do this. So I need to say I want a lawyer, and that's going to shut you guys up. I'm not and talking if, anymore. If you just... I want a lawyer. I'm done. I'm not talking anymore. Detectives obtained search warrants for his house. There, they found stolen Toys R Us items, electronics, and an SD card. When the detectives checked the SD card, they found a video of Bernard. The video showed Bernard's distinct bow-legged walk and the same sweatpants he wore on the day of the murder. According to reports, Bernard completed his studies at St. Francis High School in Athol Springs in 1993 and obtained his degree from Canisius College in 1997. He began his career at a large retail store and ventured into acquiring some properties in South Buffalo and the Southtons. Financial records indicate that Bernard secured a position at Toys R Us in 2007. However, a tragic incident unfolded in late 2008 when his wife, Heather, was diagnosed with breast cancer. As their medical bills mounted, along with credit card debts and unpaid utility and tax bills on their eight properties, the couple made a difficult decision to declare bankruptcy in 2009. They managed to sell off most of their properties, keeping only their residence in Elma and a house in Lackawanna. Notably, neighbors residing in the upscale Kettle Run Road in Elma reported recurring disputes between Bernard and Heather, prompting police involvement on three separate instances. On one occasion, Bernard was arrested on criminal possession of a weapon and harassment charges after he'd fired a weapon at his wife Heather. On June 8, 2013, Heather took a step to protect herself by filing for a restraining order after Bernard fired his 9mm Beretta through the back window. Further investigation revealed Bernard's elaborate scheme. He'd been stealing merchandise from Toys R Us and selling it on eBay, using his position as loss prevention manager to cover his tracks. Confronted with the evidence on October 16, 2013, Bernard remained defensive, claiming that he was innocent and requesting legal representation. Bernard eventually confessed to the police about the events that unfolded in the Toys R Us store that fateful day. He confirmed that he'd entered the store with the intention to rob the safe, driven by his mounting debt and financial strain. Inside the manager's office, he unplugged the DVR to disable surveillance. However, Larry unexpectedly entered the office and confronted Bernard. A struggle ensued as Larry bravely attempted to unmask Bernard and prevent the robbery. Tragically, during this confrontation, Bernard resorted to violence and killed Larry, who was valiantly defending the store and the people he worked with. Bernard's financial situation had driven him to desperate measures. He was living far beyond his means, with debts totaling $1.2 million, a $450,000 home, and a late model Cadillac Escalade. He also admitted to stealing approximately $223,000 worth of items and money from various Toys R Us stores. In a plea agreement, Bernard confessed to the theft of around $191,000 worth of merchandise and roughly 19,000 from three Toys R Us stores located in Pennsylvania. As part of the deal, he committed to paying $223,000 in restitution to his former employer. Bernard eventually pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter, acknowledging his original intent to rob the store and the subsequent events. Assistant U.S. Attorney Timothy C. Lynch noted that the burglaries all occurred after the murder of Larry Wells. In July 2014, he faced the consequences of his actions receiving the harshest penalty under the law, 25 years in prison and five years of probation. 48-year-old Bernard Gruxa is currently serving time at Sing Sing Correctional Facility in Ossining, New York. He's expected to remain in custody until at least 2035. Larry's death was hard to take for the community and his family, especially his wife Jill, who was pregnant at the time. In her victim impact statement, Jill Wells expressed the profound loss caused by Bernard Gruxa's actions. I lost my husband, my best friend, the man who I love so much. We were supposed to grow old together. Our daughter, who was four at the time, lost the best father she could have. They did everything together. Our youngest daughter, who was not even born yet, has to live knowing she never got to meet her daddy and experience his kindness and love. She noted that Bernard didn't just rob her family of Larry. He took away her husband and her best friend. 
Their future plans of growing old together, raising their children, and witnessing their journey through life were shattered. Instead of enjoying these moments, Larry was tragically taken away from them, leaving an irreplaceable void in their lives. Larry Wells' story emphasizes the significance of thorough background checks and ongoing assessments for individuals in positions of trust. Employers must prioritize verifying qualifications, criminal histories, and personal backgrounds to ensure the safety of their workplace and community. On August 30th, 1993, Craig Williamson gave his wife, Christine Reinhardt, one last phone call before disappearing to the wind. The Colorado man was on a trip for his booming fishing business when he suddenly vanished without a trace. For several months, Christine scoured different towns, enlisting the help of family, friends, strangers, and media houses. With no strong leads, law enforcement started giving up on the matter, but Christine's hope for finding her husband refused to wane. There was no lead, clue, witness, or evidence. So how could she find Craig against all odds? Did he just get tired and run away? Or was there a more sinister truth waiting to be unveiled? While Craig lived at and operated his farm in Wisconsin, business trips saw him traveling to several states to meet suppliers and customers. On this particular journey, he was headed to Colorado Springs for business. Located 70 miles south of Denver, Colorado Springs is the second most populous city in the state of Colorado and the largest city in El Paso County. Seated in the east central of the state, the city had a population of 281,000 in the 1990s and had problems associated with cities with leaping population growth. There were overcrowded roads and highways, as well as a high rate of crime. The city's economy is primarily driven by the United States military, the booming high-tech industry, tourism, and by extension, the service industry. The blossoming tourism and high-tech industries in the state drew Craig to meet necessary contacts for purchasing stock and machinery for his business. Craig was born in 1944. A few years after his first marriage ended in a divorce, he met 41-year-old Christine in September 1990. At the time, he was a fisherman and sea diver who loved to explore the ocean. They both practiced New Age beliefs and were attending an Indian medicine wheel session in Port Townsend that September. During the days-long retreat, attendees sat in sweat lodges where they meditated together in groups to search for spiritual harmony. Before the weekend was over, Craig asked Christine to dinner. There, they shared a kiss and felt the spark of an undeniable passion for each other. Their love story was fast-paced, and the lovebirds fell deeper as they got to know each other better. Despite knowing each other for just a few weeks, the couple decided to formalize their union and tied the knot one month after meeting. The wedding was held at Lake Tahoe in California on September 7, 1990, with just a few friends and family in attendance. In the low-key affair, Craig and Christine were dressed in simple clothes and exchanged rings bought at a pawn shop. In the early months of their marriage, the lovebirds lived in the capital city of Olympia, Washington. Here, Craig went fishing and dived for sea urchins in the San Juan Islands. However, the couple had bigger dreams of establishing a fishery business. In 1991, they both moved back to Christine's home state of Wisconsin, where they bought a property near Christine's family farm. The plan was to build a fish farm for exotic African tilapia and supply it in large quantities to restaurants and markets. This dream was very big and capital-intensive as well. They committed all their savings of about $80,000 to the business. However, this was only a pinch of what they needed. They had to borrow $160,000 from Christine's father and another $255,000 from the bank. Their newly acquired building was renovated and fitted with large fish tanks. They also began to make connections with stock suppliers, restaurants, supermarkets, and traders. They also got an old school bus, which Craig repaired and added fittings for containers to convey their fish to customers. All their hard work soon paid off, and the exotic tilapia from Craig and Christine's farm became much sought after, both within the state and outside of it. With this increase in demand also came an increase to find new suppliers of the tilapia fish and buying new equipment and machinery to keep the farm running at its optimum level of performance. This need drove Craig to take a business trip to Colorado Springs to find these necessary products for the farm. Unfortunately, in this journey, much more would be lost than found. 
In his quest for a supplier who could steadily supply tilapia stock for his farm, Craig heard of Eileen Kerr, a woman who operated a fish farm in Alamosa, Colorado. On August 27, 1993, Craig went on a journey in his revamped school bus to meet Eileen for supplies in Colorado. He also intended to buy generators to provide backup power for his fish farm. Christine was concerned for Craig as he embarked on the journey. This was because one month earlier he'd suffered a concussion due to a fall. He was also having headaches before the trip. Craig, however, had promised to keep in touch throughout the journey, and he kept his promise. He arrived in Colorado Springs, got a motel room, parked his bus, and got a rental car for ease of movement. He also met Eileen, and they transacted business as scheduled. On August 30th, 1993, Craig phoned Christine at 9 p.m. as he usually did from the Motel 8 where he was lodged. He told her about his transactions throughout the day, including the purchase of farm equipment, and told her he was going to return the rental car after the call. He also asked Christine to call him the next morning by 5.30 a.m. so that he could wake up early enough for his journey back home. This was the last time Christine would hear from Craig before he disappeared. The next day, on August 31st, 1993, Christine called him as planned, but there was no response. She rang his motel room three times, and still he didn't pick up. She got worried. It was unusual that he'd refuse to pick up her call unless something had happened to him. She then contacted the front desk of the establishment, and the desk clerk who answered her call went into Craig's room to confirm if he was still in the motel. When his room was opened, Craig was nowhere to be found. The desk clerk also told Christine that the bed hadn't been slept in, indicating that Craig probably didn't make it back into the motel room after their last phone call. Christine grew even more concerned. It was uncharacteristic of him not to leave her with any information regarding his whereabouts. She contacted the Colorado Springs police and they received all necessary information about him. However, they told Christine that she had to wait another 24 hours before her report could be treated as a missing persons case. Those 24 hours passed slowly for Christine. Craig was neither found, nor did he make any contact with his wife or anybody else. On September 1st, 1993, Craig was officially declared missing. Law enforcement soon went in search of Craig, checking places he visited during the trip and other neighborhoods close to the town. First, his credit cards were found at a market in El Paso, Texas, about 675 miles from Colorado Springs. There was no definite link to how those cards got there. Headed by Colorado Springs Detective Robert Johnson, the investigations into Craig's whereabouts continued for several more days. People who had transacted business with Craig were also questioned. Eileen, whom Craig had bought fish stock from, described him as a big teddy bear who loved his wife so much. According to her, Craig had called Christine multiple times during the day without fail, even as he transacted business. He was so much in love with that lady, she said. In the second week of the search after Craig was declared missing, his rental car was found in the border city of Juarez, Mexico. The car was parked just along the border between the country and the state of Texas. All of Craig's belongings were found in the car, and the vehicle had no damage or signs of violence. However, the police found some hair clippings inside the rental car. Forensic tests carried out revealed that the clippings were strands from Craig's beard, which had most likely been cut with scissors. From his credit card transactions, they also concluded that Craig had about $2,500 on him before he disappeared. With this information, the police began to form a theory that Craig may have orchestrated his own disappearance. The beard clippings found in the rental car led them to believe that Craig was probably trying to change his look before fleeing. To answer the question of what exactly he could be fleeing from, they pointed to the bus of fish parked in a lot in Colorado Springs, which still had the fish stocks. They assumed that he probably got tired of managing a fish farm that was heavily in debt, or, like many men, he was just tired of his marriage. These theories had many holes in them. The idea that he was tired of his marriage seemed implausible with the strong bond he obviously shared with his wife, as Eileen pointed out. Also, despite the over $400,000 debt, the fish farm was booming with great prospects, and that was what led him to make the trip in the first place. After weeks of pressing for answers, Christine realized she might have to take matters in her own hands if she wanted results quickly. While the police had their own theory, Christine had hers too. Considering the concussion Craig had suffered the month before his travel, 
Christine believed he was attacked in the city when he suffered a hit to the head and probably lost his memory. This loss of memory may have led him to lose his sense of where he was, and he may have wandered off into an unknown location. Despite having no evidence, Christine had a strong gut feeling that Craig was neither abducted nor killed. Armed with this blind faith, Christine packed her bags on September 14, 1993, and headed to Colorado Springs. She was armed with Humphrey and Bogart, her two dogs, and a desperate sense of hope to find Craig, or at least gain closure about what happened to him. Christine arrived at the motel where Craig lodged for the night and went to examine the place he stayed, which was room 112. His luggage was still packed and the room was well arranged, indicating no sign of struggle. She also met with the police, where she explained her theory in a bid to get them to treat the case more seriously. According to her theory, Craig was probably fixing things in his faulty school bus just before he went back to return the rental car when someone hit him on the head from behind. According to her, he would have just gotten up from the attack and refused to get help like any other person would. In her statement, she said, This is completely in character with Craig. He'd get up and wouldn't go in to say, I'm hurt, please help me. He'd think, I have to get on with things. I have to do something. I'm supposed to go somewhere and I have to get back. She also claimed he probably wandered towards the brighter lights of the parking lot and he may have walked off to an unknown destination from there. The police listened to her, but it was obvious that they weren't convinced by her possible account of events. With Christine's hard work, missing person posters of Craig went around Colorado Springs and beyond. He was also broadcast on TV stations, and Christine pleaded for information from the public. On September 15th, one day after Christine arrived in Colorado Springs, a retired nurse, Judy Inman, was on the train heading from Montana to Denver when she spotted a disheveled man wandering in her coach car. Upon boarding the train, the man was first harassed by two drunks. He was, however, able to get past them and went to her side of the coach. On a closer look, Judy, with her professional knowledge as a nurse, was able to assess him properly. According to her, he looked like he'd suffered a sort of brain injury as he displayed all the symptoms. He was confused, agitated, and disoriented. She also noted that he kept talking about fish and the need to get back to a place. He sat near her and described his big fish farm back home with big tanks to other passengers. He also mentioned that the type of fish he sold wasn't from America. Judy arrived at her son's house in Pueblo, Colorado that evening and saw the picture of Craig on the news. She recognized the picture and contacted the police about the sighting. I know it was him, she told the authorities, as she described the man on the train. Judy's statement was taken, but little weight was given to it after attempts to trace him with the train ride proved futile. On the contrary, Christine's hopes were raised even higher with this new sighting. While the authorities were less moved to go on what seemed like a wild goose chase, Christine got to work, enlisting the help of family and friends to share posters of Craig even farther across the region, even crossing the country's boundaries to Canada. Despite continually pressing authorities, Christine noticed the case was gradually going cold as the detectives lost interest in further pursuit of Craig. This became even more apparent as the officers discouraged her from sending out more posters, stating that it could complicate their investigation. On October 27, 1993, during one of her searches, Christine came across Captain Bill Mistretta, one of the officers on the case. He repeated the same thing that colleagues had told her. Their exchange got heated, and he warned Christine in strong terms to stop her personal investigation or he would personally place the case on hold. This threat angered Christine, who had spent her third wedding anniversary alone without her husband. Promptly, she filed a complaint against the captain and got an apology from the sheriff, Bernard Barry. With this stark realization that she was the only one truly invested in finding her missing husband, Christine decided she couldn't trust the police anymore and hired a private investigator, David Boyd. Despite hiring a private investigator, Christine still continued in her personal search. Covering about 7,120 miles, Christine walked different cities, trying to pick a face out of different crowds. She did television and newspaper interviews, went to the streets and scrutinized homeless people one at a time, consulted psychics, and visited several shelters, all in a bid to find Craig. By December of 1993, Christine became invested in the September 15th sighting by Judy. Christine decided to meet with the retired nurse herself for a personal interview. 
On her way to Denver, Christine boarded a train from Montana, which went through Portland to Denver just as Judy had done. She took several pictures of the different train stations as she went by and also asked train workers questions. On December 26, 1993, she met Judy for the first time. Christine showed pictures of the train stations and landmarks around the places to help jog Judy's memory. After inspecting the pictures for a while, Judy pointed at Wishram Station and said it was definitely the place where Craig had departed from the train. Christine suspected that he would have mistaken Wishram for Washigal, another city in Washington where he lived in the 1980s. She was convinced that having lost his memory, Craig returned to the one place that seemed familiar, having lived there for so long. She also believed he might have been in search of their first home as a married couple in Olympia. She began another round of searches and headed to Washington. In one of her searches, Christine visited the Bread and Roses shelter in Olympia. She feared that he may have been gone so long that he'd be completely unrecognizable after months of wandering around. She took extra care in checking the faces. During her search, she came upon a man hunched over a hot meal of chicken and rice. The resemblance was striking with Craig. She moved closer to inspect, and the man looked up to her. With deeper scrutiny, she realized it was another stranger. It wasn't her Craig. He just looks so much like my husband, she sobbed, speaking to the shelter officer. He consoled her and allowed her to ask the residents of the shelter if they'd seen Craig. Many stared at the poster and his pictures and affirmed that they had, indeed, sighted him in different places in the city. However, no one could provide solid leads of where he could exactly be. Christine then turned to law enforcement in Olympia. She visited the Thurston County Sheriff's Office and tried to give information she'd gathered about Craig's disappearance, her suspicions, and different sightings by strangers she met in her search. While at the office, someone in a real estate office in nearby Yelm called to say a disoriented man had just wandered into their establishment. Immediately, Christine left the office to go and investigate. Just like the man in the shelter, she was yet again met with another disappointment. It wasn't her husband. At this point, there seemed to be nowhere else to go except back home to Wisconsin. Christine was frustrated after the weeks-long search. She had to return without Craig, or at least a clue of what had happened to him. When she got home, the place where the lovers once resided now felt empty without him. It also didn't help that everything in the house reminded her of him all the time after she returned. Yet, she refused to let her hope diminish, even with no leads in the case. Christine's dire situation and Craig's mysterious disappearance caught the attention of the popular TV show Unsolved Mysteries. Christine provided all she knew of his sudden disappearance and also what her search had yielded. Speaking on the show, she said, I can't give up. I will never give up. I will just constantly look for him until I die or he's found. I mean, those are the only two options. I know he's alive, and I know someday I'll find him. The trouble is I don't know when, and I just have to keep hanging on. The hardest part is hanging on. The police stuck to their theory about Craig's disappearance. They believed that by dropping his credit cards in Texas, he was trying to throw investigations off his trail. They also insisted that the faulty school bus perhaps pushed him to the edge of despair and led to his decision to disappear. The other scenario, according to them, was that he was dead and buried by his attackers. The next year, on May 25, 1994, the Unsolved Mysteries show aired Craig's case on the episode. Christine waited with bated breath, hoping for good news. It didn't come. Days turned into weeks, but nobody had any information about Craig. Two months after the initial broadcast, Craig's case was aired again on July 19, 1995, and things took a sharp new turn. A man from Key West, Florida, was watching the broadcast after a long day and saw himself on the TV. With the information provided in the TV show, Craig was able to contact the producers as well as Christine. She could barely believe her ears when her long-lost husband called. The couple met the same month, and Craig was able to narrate what had happened to him. According to his account of events, He'd been mugged in Colorado Springs on the night of his disappearance and developed amnesia after the attack. His amnesia was made severe due to the concussion he suffered one month before his trip to Colorado Springs. 
This made him completely lose the memory of everything before the attack. He claimed he woke up in a hospital with the name Ron and didn't remember anything about his past life. After getting treated at the hospital, he wandered aimlessly throughout the United States looking for clues about himself before arriving in Florida where he finally settled and found a job as a diver. Craig's story was corroborated by Bob Ming, Craig's manager, who said that Craig had frequently told the story to co-workers and anyone who'd listen. The two lost lovers found their way back to each other in July of 1994 when Craig traveled back to Wisconsin. While Christine was happy to see her husband, unfortunately, he had no memory of her left or the life he lived before he vanished. In an attempt to jog his memory, the couple traveled back to Colorado Springs, the place of his disappearance. They traced his movements, visiting the places he'd been during that August 1993 trip. Unfortunately, this again yielded no results. Christine and Craig tried to reignite their love, but there was nothing there anymore for Craig. In the place of Christine's spot in his heart was a blank space of forgotten memories. Unfortunately, the couple had to end their marriage in a divorce. However, they remained friends despite the split. Craig moved back to California to stay with friends. For Christine, the months of searching for Craig with no result had taken a toll on her. However, finding him without the memories that they'd shared together was an even bigger blow, and she needed a fresh start. Christine then moved back to Wyoming, where she too started a new life. On September 15th, 2015, Police officers in Dusseldorf, Germany, responded to an apartment complex after receiving reports of an attempted burglary at one of the residences. When they arrived, it appeared that the robber had already fled the scene. Officers then spoke to the woman who lived in the apartment. Her reluctance to speak made officers suspicious about her behavior, so they questioned her further. They'd soon realized that the woman had a link to the case of murder victim, 24-year-old Petra Pazitka. But who was the woman? And how did she know Petra? Braunschweig, Germany is the largest city in the state of Lower Saxony with a population of almost 250,000. During the medieval area, Braunschweig was a powerful and influential center of commerce and trade. Today, it's a major center of scientific research and development. Its architecture is heavily influenced by the Middle Ages and the city's famous for sausages, asparagus, and gingerbread. It's a city that combines traditional living with modern conveniences and is a must for those wanting to experience history and art combined. As for safety, Braunschweig has a relatively low crime rate as compared to other European cities. However, in 1984, Braunschweig was the center of the strange disappearance of Petra Pasitka. There's never been much information released about 24-year-old Petra Pazitka. She was born in 1960, but exactly where remains unknown. She was born and raised by her parents in Wolfsburg, Germany, along with her younger brother, Karsten. According to media reports, she was raised in a happy and loving environment. After completing her high school studies, Petra enrolled at a university in Braunschweig, Germany to study towards a degree in computer science. The city was about 20 miles away from her hometown of Wolfsburg, so she decided to find accommodations at a student housing facility to avoid the daily commute. From reports, Petra was known to keep a low profile and kept mostly to herself while focusing on completing her studies. She kept a few close friends, but there was no mention of a romantic partner. She was considered studious and known to always attend her classes and other engagements unless she had a valid reason. On July 26, 1984, Petra had a normal day ahead of her. She'd been living in student housing in the city of Braunschweig, Germany, while studying towards her master's degree in computer science after completing both her undergraduate and honors degrees. Petra was in the process of completing her thesis in computer language. On that Thursday morning, Petra dressed and got ready for the day. She'd made plans to spend the upcoming holidays with her family back in Wolfsburg, and work on completing her thesis while at home. Petra's parents had gone away on vacation, and she intended on going home to celebrate her brother's birthday that afternoon. Petra told a friend that she first needed to visit her dentist before taking a bus back to Wolfsburg. 
She'd also asked her neighbor to keep an eye on her plants while she was away for the holidays. Petra visited the dentist and was last seen waiting for a bus in the Braunschweig city center sometime that afternoon. However, Petra never made it home that evening. Her brother was concerned, but believed that Petra might not have been able to make the trip because of her extensive study schedule. When two entire days had passed and he hadn't heard from his older sister, Karsten knew something was wrong. Petra hadn't even called to wish him a happy birthday. She wasn't the type of person to miss important family events. So on July 28, 1984, he called the police department in Wolfsburg to report Petra missing. Police launched an immediate search for Petra. The areas between Braunschweig and Wolfsburg were searched extensively. Petra's friends were questioned about her behavior prior to her disappearance. They all told police officers that Petra seemed normal. Her friends said that Petra was looking forward to going home and spending time with her family. They were also asked if she'd been acting differently before she disappeared. Every person that was questioned said that Petra kept to her normal routines. A search of Petra's apartment didn't reveal much either. All her personal belongings were left behind. There was nothing taken from her apartment. All that she had were the clothes she was wearing that day in her handbag. Police looked through her notes, but found nothing that indicated she may have had a secret lover or was planning to run away. Police then visited Petra's home in Wolfsburg. They interviewed her family to find out if there were any problems within the household. From what they'd learned, the family home was stable and loving. Both Petra's parents and her brothers said that they were a close-knit family and there'd been no traumatic experience in her childhood or teenage years that could have prompted her disappearance. A search of Petra's bedroom at her parents' house once again revealed that she'd not taken any personal items with her. Police discovered that she'd also left some money behind at her family home. Then they looked through her bank account and found that she also had money in her account that hadn't been accessed since the day of her disappearance. With no new leads, the investigation began to slow down. However, over the next few months, police continued to monitor Petra's bank account, hoping that they could track her whereabouts. There still hadn't been any activity. To officers, it seemed impossible that any person who disappeared by their own free will would be able to survive without money. They now believed the worst had happened. Police theorized that Petra may have met with an unfortunate end. Once again, they canvassed the area she frequented, but met with the same answers. No one had seen the young woman since the day she vanished. Searches of the routes between Wolfsburg and Braunschweig were conducted. Still, there was no trace of a body or any of Petra's personal belongings. Her family and friends made several appeals to the public, but nothing had come of their efforts. The case remained open, but was growing cold. On January the 11th, 1985, six months after Petra's disappearance, a German crime TV show named Actensation XY that was similar in format to the US TV show Crime Watchers aired an episode about Petra's disappearance. The show featured a reenactment of what police had come to believe may have happened to Petra the day she disappeared. Using police reports and eyewitness accounts, the show's producers recreated the route Petra would have taken from her hostel to the dentist and then to the bus stop that she was last seen at. Police hoped that by replaying the events of Petra's disappearance, it could help jog the memories of any possible eyewitnesses. They'd also told the public that the investigation was now being considered a possible homicide. However, their hopes were dashed when no new information or leads came from the airing of the TV show. However, unbeknownst to investigators at the time, the case was about to heat up once more. In July 1985, a year after Petra disappeared from a bus stop in Braunschweig, police began investigating the murder of a 14-year-old girl. According to reports, the girl had been assaulted and then strangled. Her body was discovered in a wooded area behind a bus stop. It had struck police that this was the same bus stop that Petra was last seen standing at when she disappeared on July 26, 1984, almost exactly a year earlier. Police conducted an investigation into the murder of the 14-year-old girl and quickly found themselves a suspect. According to German law, the authorities do not allow the true identity of a suspect to be released to the public for the safety of the suspect if he or she is released from prison in the future. The suspect was given the alias Gunther K. 
He was a 19-year-old man who lived in Braunschweig and worked as a carpenter's assistant. Prior to the crime, Gunther K. did not have any known criminal convictions. Gunther K. was caught after several eyewitnesses came forward and said that they'd seen him talking to the girl at the bus stop before her body was discovered in the woods. During questioning, he confessed to luring the girl into the woods before attacking and killing her. Police then brought out their file on Petra Pazitka. Gunther K. denied any knowledge of Petra or involvement in her disappearance, but the police didn't back down. They continued to question Gunther K. when he remained in custody for the murder of the 14-year-old girl. Despite repeatedly questioning Gunther K. and the use of various tactics to get a confession out of him, their suspect remained silent. Police believed that they'd reached an impasse with Gunther K. Unexpectedly, their case was about to take another turn. In 1987, Gunther K. decided he wanted to speak to police once more. This time, he admitted to meeting Petra near the same bus stop and luring her out to the woods to kill her, just as he did with a teenage girl. Based on the information provided by Gunther K., police launched a second search and investigation into Petra's disappearance and possible murder. Using sniffer dogs and several search teams, police tried desperately to locate Petra's remains. After an extensive search of the forested area, they came up empty-handed. A search of Gunther K.'s residence did not provide police with any physical evidence that linked him to the disappearance of Petra. Gunther K. eventually went on trial for the murder of the 14-year-old girl. Although he confessed to murdering Petra, Gunther K. was never formally charged with her murder due to lack of evidence. He was found guilty of the assault and murder of the 14-year-old girl and sentenced to life in prison. Years after he was imprisoned, Gunther K. allegedly retracted his statement. He never provided any reason as to why he initially confessed to the murder of Petra Pazitka. In 1989, Petra Pazitka was declared legally dead after five years of being missing without a trace. Her family was left shattered by her disappearance, and they'd come to believe their daughter was dead and her remains lost forever. The case was officially closed by police. Petra's parents and brother mourned her loss, and after years of waiting for a miracle, Petra's father eventually passed away without knowing what had really happened to his daughter. But no one would believe the unexpected twist that was about to happen in the case over three decades later. On September 15, 2015, police in Dusseldorf, Germany responded to a call from an apartment complex reporting an attempted burglary. When they arrived at the apartment, they were greeted by an older woman and several other residents. The woman explained that she'd returned home and noticed pry marks on the outer frame of her front door. The marks looked as if they'd been made by a crowbar. Police searched the apartment and found that nothing had been taken. They questioned the woman who told them her name was Mrs. Petra Schneider and that she was 55 years old. She had seemed a bit evasive when answering personal questions, which prompted the police to ask her for proof of her identity. At first, she refused, but she eventually gave in and brought out an old identity document and student card. Police on the scene were not prepared for what they were about to discover. On the identity document and student card was the name Petra Pazitka. Police once again asked the woman for her real name, and she confessed that she was Petra Pazitka, the woman who was reported missing in 1984 and then declared dead in 1989. Police then asked Petra to come with them to the station to answer a few questions. At the police station, officers were curious about what caused Petra to go into hiding. She told police officers that she'd made the decision of her own free will. When asked if she'd experienced any trauma in her childhood or as an adult, Petra said that wasn't the case. She explained to officers that she'd experienced a very good childhood and did not encounter any problems in her adult life either. She was then asked how she'd managed to pay for living expenses when she'd initially disappeared. Petra told officers she'd saved up about 4,000 Deutschmarks, equivalent to about 1,200 US dollars in today's currency, and had used that money to pay for her accommodations. She also took on several menial jobs and took payment in cash. According to reports, Petra had also taken on several illicit jobs to make herself extra money anonymously. She didn't open a bank account and paid for everything, including rent, 
with cash she'd made from the several jobs she was doing. Officers then asked her how she managed to remain undetected over the years. Petra told them that she didn't have a passport, driver's license, or bank account. She'd been living under a false name without official documents for the last 31 years. Petra confessed to moving around a lot in her younger years and had lived in several different cities in West Germany. She had then moved to the apartment in Dusseldorf in 2004 and had been living there ever since. To their knowledge, police said that Petra never married or had any children. She appeared to have remained single since her disappearance all those years ago. A check of her fingerprints on the police database proved that she was, in fact, Petra Pazitka. The discovery of Petra created quite a stir in the German media. Neighbors of Petra who were interviewed by police and reporters said that Petra was the only person they'd ever seen enter the apartment. She'd always been quiet and kept to herself most of the time. Petra, they said, was not someone who brought a lot of attention to herself. Everyone knew Petra as Mrs. Schneider. They never knew she had any living relatives. Upon receiving the news that Petra was found alive in Dusseldorf, her mother and brother became overwhelmed. Police reported that they were in tears after learning that Petra was still alive. Petra, though, remained adamant that she did not want to go back to her family and did not make any contact with them despite their eagerness to see her again. Both Petra's mother and brother resorted to writing a letter and handing it over to police to give to Petra. They hoped that she'd eventually come to her senses and return to the family home. Petra was not charged by police officers for disappearing in 1984. Police stated that it wasn't illegal for adults to voluntarily disappear. However, she was told by authorities that she'd have to have herself declared as alive by the government once more. It's been reported that to this day, Petra continues to live alone and has not made any contact with her family since she was discovered alive. Despite the extensive media coverage on the case since she was found alive, Petra has refused to tell reporters the real reason for her disappearance and has asked for privacy. Petra's case has puzzled crime enthusiasts over the years and many have come up with bizarre theories that explained her reason for disappearing. Some theorize that Petra was recruited by a West German secret service agency during the Cold War. This theory was backed by the fact that Petra was an expert in the field of computer technology and during the Cold War, computers were a new emerging technology. Many believe that Petra would have proved to be an invaluable asset to any spy agency. Her ability to work with computers added credibility to this theory because she would have been useful in the field of research and intelligence gathering. The theory was further compounded by the confession of Gunther K. Conspiracy theorists had come to the conclusion that police forced a confession out of Gunther K. to take off the pressure from Petra's disappearance and stop people from asking too many questions. This allegedly was a very common practice used during the Cold War to have important individuals disappear from society. However, the prevailing theory is that Petra simply wanted to be left alone. Some believed that she craved being anonymous or was extremely introverted. This need may have developed from the political tension Germany faced during the Cold War. Given her quiet personality, it's believed that Petra just wanted to get away from it all. By faking her own death, she was able to continue living without the need to be part of a society that was fighting for freedom. The stress of the era might have caused her to feel the need to be alone. Petra's case has captured the attention of many within the true crime community and has given rise to much speculation. Many have found her behavior to be selfish, while others were sure that her degree in computer science was the main reason for her disappearance. In the end though, Petra's actions did have a detrimental effect on the people around her. Not only did her disappearance lead to a massive search and the waste of valuable resources, but she also put her family through a tremendous amount of emotional damage. For years, they believed that Petra had died and her body would never be found. Many have argued in online forums that Petra should have told her family that she wanted to leave and be on her own. Even to this day, Petra's stubborn resolve to remain anonymous and have no contact with her family has left people commenting that she may be suffering with severe anxiety or other mental health issues. It remains to be seen if Petra will change her mind about reuniting with her family. Today's case goes beyond bizarre. 
Petra Pazitka's disappearance is proof that if people want to disappear, it's not a very difficult scheme to pull off. But her reluctance to explain herself continues to leave people suspicious about her reasons. Added to that, many have asked why Gunther K confessed to a murder he clearly did not commit. So today, we ask you about your opinion of the case. Do you believe that Petra could have suffered a breakdown that led to her disappearing? Or do you think that there's more to the case, as conspiracy theorists suggest? Could it be that Gunther K was, at the time of his confession, being coerced into providing a distraction to pull the attention of Petra's sudden disappearance? I miss her so much every day. <laughs> And we finally got justice for her, my daughters, my whole family's been waiting for this day and it came true. She deserves it. She deserves it and he deserves everything he's got. On January the 11th, 2012, 21-year-old Carissa Kunko went about her normal routine in Baldwin Borough, Pennsylvania, just as she'd done countless times in the past. Little did anyone know that this day would mark the beginning of a tragic and mysterious journey. Toward the evening of that day, Carissa went to see a friend who was on the brink of harming themselves. Carissa's compassionate and caring nature pushed her to help. The next day, Carissa was declared missing. But what happened to Carissa? Did she just vanish? Or was there a more troubling reason behind her disappearance? Today's story takes us to Baldwin Borough. Baldwin is situated in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. It's a thriving borough within the greater Pittsburgh metropolitan area. According to the 2020 census, the borough's population stood at 21,500. Baldwin boasts an impressive record in terms of safety. With a crime rate of 24, which is significantly lower than the national average, Baldwin demonstrates its commitment to safety. The violent crime rate in 2012 was 65.5, which is significantly lower than the U.S. average of 187.4. It's this relatively safe borough that Carissa Kunko and her family lived in. Carissa Kunko was born in March 1991 to her loving parents, Kathy and Paul Kunko, in Baldwin, Pennsylvania. Carissa grew up with her lovely older sister, Kayla Kunko, and the two were inseparable. Her uniqueness radiated through her passions and quirks that set her apart from the crowd. Carissa was compassionate, smart, and athletic, and her presence was a source of joy to those around her. Growing up, Carissa's dreams and aspirations were as boundless as her energy. She was a young woman with dreams of making a difference in the world. Carissa's journey was one of hope and ambition. She pursued her dreams with determination, hoping to become a pharmacist. However, life's demands prompted her to take a break from her studies, opting to work two jobs to secure additional funds. Carissa also found herself drawn to the allure of a basketball court. In 2009, when Carissa was 18, she met her first boyfriend, Jordan Clemens, when she went to watch a basketball game. Jordan Clemens was born to Robert Clemens and Frida Thorpe in Baldwin Borough in 1986. He was a complex individual shaped by a life marked by triumphs and challenges. From an early age, Jordan displayed a remarkable talent for sports, especially football, which became a defining aspect of his character. His time at Fort Cherry High School saw him shine as a standout football player, showcasing his physical prowess and his dedication to the sport. Through football, he found common ground with his uncle, Perry Kemp, a former Green Bay Packers player. However, beneath the surface of his athletic achievements lay a turbulent family environment that left an indelible mark on his psyche. Jordan's father, Robert Clemens, was a drug addict and an alcoholic, which often caused issues in their household. Their father would often beat their mother, and Jordan and his siblings had to intervene to protect their mother from their father's rages. His pursuit of excellence on the field was driven by a need to prove his worth and carve out a space where he could excel and be recognized. This troubling background, coupled with the tragic loss of his older brother, sent Jordan on a journey of self-discovery that would shape his path in unforeseen ways. The pain of his brother's passing and the weight of an unhappy home life cast shadows that he struggled to navigate. Jordan's aspirations and dreams were mixed with his search for a sense of belonging and identity. Beneath the layers of pain, he longed for connection, but found little outlet in his bond with football and his uncle. So, when he met Carissa on the basketball court that fateful day, 
he felt a different peace and knew that this was exactly what he'd been longing for. It didn't take long for the two to start dating, and basketball served as their common ground. Carissa's family welcomed Jordan into their lives despite his challenging background, seeing the potential for change and growth in him. Carissa's compassionate nature led her to believe that she could make a positive impact on his life. Her heart's desire to heal those around her knew no bounds. Despite the happiness they shared, there were dark shadows lurking beneath the surface. Signs of trouble surfaced about six months into their relationship when they started to fall through on plans with friends and Carissa's vibrant energy waned. It was as though a storm was brewing, hidden behind her joyful face. But Carissa mastered the art of disguise, always wearing a smile that concealed the troubles inside. The turning point arrived on December 18th, 2011. Following a night out for a friend's birthday, Carissa returned to Jordan's parents' house where she was brutally attacked. Battered and bruised, Carissa called her sister Kayla and told her she'd been attacked by Jordan. The incident showed the level of abuse she'd been enduring for the better part of their relationship. Her family rallied around her and her sister swung into action. She reported the case to the police and filed a restraining order against Jordan. Following this incident, Jordan fled the state and so the restraining order couldn't be served until the police could get a hold of him. Despite filing a restraining order, the hold that Jordan had over her persisted. On January 12, 2012, Clemens and Kunko began chatting on Facebook. He sent her secret messages, promising to change and be a better person. He even swore to go to therapy, but Kayla made Carissa promise not to entertain his apologies. On January the 11th, 2012, Clemens said he'd surrender, but only if he saw Carissa. He threatened to harm himself if she didn't agree. Carissa was skeptical, but she still cared for him. She knew meeting him would upset her loved ones. Eventually, she agreed to meet him, and the two drove around in Carissa's vehicle. However, after a night of catching up and shopping with Jordan, Carissa went missing. Carissa's disappearance sent shockwaves through her family, and they couldn't get rid of the fear that something tragic had occurred. Around 8.36 p.m. on January the 11th, 2012, accompanied by Donnie Makowski, Carissa's stepfather, Kathy Kunko went to the Baldwin Borough Police Station to report Carissa as missing. They spoke with Officer Sean Biagini and shared their concern that Jordan might be involved in Carissa's disappearance. Officer Biagini issued a be-on-the-lookout alert, known as a bolo, for Carissa's vehicle within a 50-mile radius. Kathy Kunko and Makowski completed a missing persons form under Officer Biagini's guidance. He submitted this form into a national system used by law enforcement to track missing individuals. The investigator's first action was to contact Jordan Clemens, as the investigation began, Officer Biagini learned that there might be an active arrest warrant for Jordan. To confirm Jordan's most recent address, he contacted Washington County Probation Services. Kathy had shared the mobile phone numbers for both Carissa and Jordan with Officer Biagini. These numbers were passed on to the supervisor of the Baldwin Borough's Dispatch Center. Using a technique called pinging, the supervisor attempted to determine the approximate location of the phones based on the signal towers they were communicating with. The ping indicated that both Carissa and Jordan's phones were near each other, sending signals from a tower in Hickory Township in Washington County, Pennsylvania. Officer Biagini took steps to keep the investigation moving. He got in touch with the Pennsylvania State Police, who provide law enforcement in Hickory Township, and let them know that Carissa and Jordan might be in that area. He asked for troopers to search for Carissa's vehicle. Officer Biagini continued to oversee the investigation from the Baldwin Borough Station. He requested additional pings to try and trace the movements of Carissa and Jordan. From their investigations and the messages they were able to retrieve from their phones, the police were able to piece together what happened. On January 10, 2012, Carissa and Jordan had started chatting on Facebook. During the chat, Jordan admitted to being aware of the protection from abuse order Carissa had obtained against him. The topic of their conversation revolved around Jordan considering turning himself into the police. Carissa urged him to stop evading authorities and to surrender. She expressed her love for him, apologized, and revealed that she missed him. The conversation extended into January the 11th, 2012. Jordan reiterated his intention to surrender, but insisted that he needed to see Carissa before doing so. He told her that he'd end his own life if she didn't agree to meet him. He even claimed to have acquired a firearm. 
Jordan insisted that Carissa was the only person who could assist him in this situation. Carissa found herself in a difficult position. She had conflicting emotions towards Jordan, including feelings of love and understanding. At the same time, she was scared of him. She repeatedly expressed her fear and anger to Jordan for placing her in such a situation. The internal struggle was further complicated by her awareness of the expectations and concerns of her friends and family. Carissa knew that meeting Jordan would be seen as a betrayal to those who cared about her deeply. Her loved ones vehemently disapproved of any association with Jordan due to his history of domestic abuse. Carissa candidly explained to Jordan that seeing him would not only hurt her, but also the people who cared about her well-being. However, despite feeling that it was a bad idea, she eventually gave in and agreed to meet him. Around 5.30 p.m., Carissa, driving a black Toyota two-door convertible, picked up Jordan on Maytide Street in the Brentwood area in Allegheny County. They then headed to a PNC bank branch in Brentwood, where Carissa used an ATM to withdraw money. At the bank, Amanda Stasiowski, a bank official, also happened to be present. Stasiowski saw Carissa, wearing a bright pink Point Park University sweatshirt, walk from the ATM to her car and get in on the driver's side. While she noticed someone in the passenger seat, Stasiowski couldn't identify that person. Later, surveillance footage from the bank confirmed this version of events. Stasiowski was the last person, aside from Jordan, to see Carissa before her death. In the hours that followed, Jordan used Carissa's debit card and even a card belonging to Carissa's father, Paul Kunko. He used Carissa's card to buy gas at a service station in Washington, Pennsylvania. Around 12.30 a.m. on January 12, 2012, Jordan tried to withdraw money using Carissa's father's card at a drive through ATM at a bank in Washington, but he was unsuccessful. Although his face wasn't captured on camera, surveillance footage did capture the left arm of the person using the ATM, revealing tattoos that matched those on Jordan's left arm. At 2.10 a.m., Jordan entered a Walmart in Washington and used Paul Kunko's debit card to purchase a video game system. Afterwards, Jordan returned to Carissa's car and drove away, and this too was captured by surveillance video. At 6 a.m., Jordan attempted to buy cigarettes at Winkle's gas station in Cecil Township. The attendant, Leanne Andrews, was familiar with Jordan due to past interactions at the station. Despite recognizing him, Andrews requested identification before selling him the cigarettes. The attendant noted that Jordan appeared nervous and restless, though not intoxicated. However, instead of showing identification, Jordan handed over an orange PNC bank debit card that did not belong to him. He then left the store, got into Carissa's car, and drove away. The investigation then turned to suspicious activity involving a debit card linked to Carissa's father, Paul Kunko. Officer Biagini contacted Paul Kunko to inform him that his debit card had been used, or an attempt had been made to use it that night. The police used these transactions, along with those involving Carissa's debit card, to try and track Jordan's movements. However, they still couldn't locate either Jordan or Carissa. Around 9.24 a.m. on January 12, 2012, Officer James Falconer of the Cecil Township Police Department in Washington County was sent to Gladden Road to investigate a car crash. At the scene, he found Carissa's vehicle crashed into a tree off the road, still running in forward gear. It seemed the vehicle hadn't managed to navigate a bend in the road, leading it to veer off and hit the tree. Officer Falconer opened the driver's door but couldn't find anyone inside. However, he noticed a considerable amount of blood and human feces on the back seat. He then checked the passenger's side and discovered a purse on the seat. Officer Falconer reported the crash to 911 and asked them to check the vehicle's registration to identify the owner. Dispatch informed him that the vehicle was part of a bolo. By then, firefighters and paramedics had arrived. A paramedic had put the car in park and turned off the engine. Officer Falconer quickly recognized the situation as a potential crime scene and instructed everyone to step away. He also closed off both ends of Gladden Road. A few hours later, Corporal Richard Hunter from the Pennsylvania State Police Forensic Services Unit arrived at the crash site to process the scene. After documenting the scene through photos and videos, Corporal Hunter opened the driver's side door of the Toyota and immediately observed blood on the door's interior and a significant amount of blood in the back seat. He and his team collected several physical items found on the ground inside the car, including a red butane lighter, a CO2 cartridge, a Sheets coffee cup, and three empty Coors Light beer cans. One of the cans had a puncture hole, while another was sealed but dented, causing the liquid to drain out. Trooper Todd Porter, also part of the Forensic Services Unit, 
further examined the vehicle. Inside, he discovered Carissa's driver's license, a bra, bloody women's pants, and a medical document with Jordan's name on it. Removing the back seat, Trooper Porter found that it had absorbed a significant amount of blood, with additional pooling of blood underneath. There were no drugs or alcohol inside the car, but he did find a plastic bag with a white residue and a piece of chore boy, often used in smoking crack cocaine. Around the same time Officer Falconer located the Toyota, William Boholich and Eric Schaud of Banks & Engineers, Inc. were driving on Washington Avenue and Sabo Road in Hickory Township for a land survey. Schaud noticed a bright pink sweatshirt among leaves at the base of a tree. Although it seemed to be out of place, they continued their survey, planning to return later to investigate the sweatshirt. Around 11.20 a.m., they returned, discovered blood on the sweatshirt, and found women's underwear in a sock nearby. They noticed drag marks leading into the woods and an outline of a human body beneath leaves. They called 911. After completing the processing of the Toyota, Corporal Hunter went to the location where Baholich and Shod found the body, about seven to eight miles from Gladden Road. He observed that the pink sweatshirt was soaked with blood around the waist and draped over the body, which was covered by a decomposing tree stump. He examined the area, finding a spray deodorant bottle, a styrofoam cup, and a purple woman's shirt. He also discovered an empty Bud Light beer can. At 2.42 p.m., Washington County Coroner Timothy Warco arrived at Sabo Road to inspect the body. After removing the tree stump and leaves, he uncovered a naked woman's body with a severe, deep laceration across her throat. Although the wound suggested there should be significant blood, there was no pooling of blood around or under the body. Around 2 p.m. the following day, two police officers visited the Kunko family. When the officers told the family that they found her body and were investigating her death, Carissa's parents immediately started crying with Carissa's mother howling. Their loving daughter, age 21, had been tragically taken from them. Evidence of Jordan's involvement was all over the crime scene. At the stroke of midnight on January 12, 2012, Jordan Clemens turned himself in at the Pennsylvania State Police Barracks located in Washington, Pennsylvania. He was charged with first-degree murder. Jordan's case was transferred to Judge Gary Gilman for trial. Jury selection began on March 11, 2015 and concluded on March 24, 2015. During the jury selection process, Jordan did not renew his motion for a change of venue. The guilt phase of Jordan's trial commenced on May 4, 2015. Both the Commonwealth and Jordan presented a substantial amount of testimony and evidence. At the conclusion of the evidence, Jordan asked Judge Gilman to instruct the jury about the potential defense of voluntary intoxication or drug condition in relation to first-degree murder. During the closing arguments, Jordan did not deny the act of killing Carissa. Instead, through his legal representation, he urged the jury to consider whether the Commonwealth had successfully proven that he had intended to kill Carissa. Jordan's team focused on the testimony of Leanne Andrews, the gas station attendant, who mentioned his nervous and fidgety behavior around the time of the murder. Jordan's defense attorney also pointed out the circumstances of the car crash, suggesting that they indicated that he was not in a sound and sober state of mind. The defense highlighted the presence of empty beer cans, chore boy, and an empty baggie with white residue at the crash scene. He argued that when taken together, these factors indicated he wasn't capable of forming a specific intent to kill. Consequently, the defense asked the jury to find that the Commonwealth had not proven beyond doubt that he had willfully and with premeditation killed Carissa, which would require a verdict of third-degree murder instead of first-degree. After receiving instructions and deliberating, the jury dismissed Jordan's claims and found him guilty of first-degree murder, aggravated assault, abuse of a corpse, tampering with evidence, and access device fraud. On May 15, 2015, Judge Gilman sentenced Jordan to death. Additionally, Judge Gilman sentenced Jordan to an overall period of 21 to 42 months in prison for his other convictions, with these sentences to be served concurrently with the death sentence. On May 4, 2017, Jordan appealed his sentence. On July 25, 2017, the court denied his petition. After the jury's verdict was announced, Jordan's family left the courthouse without offering any comments. On the other hand, Carissa's family, who'd been instructed not to display any outward symbols, promptly changed into t-shirts that supported her memory. One of Carissa's brothers-in-law even displayed a tattoo of her on his back. I miss her so much every day. And we finally got justice for her, my daughters, my whole families. 
been waiting for this day and it came true. She deserves it. She deserves it and he deserves everything he's got. But a bittersweet for us. Obviously, Chris is not here, but we got justice for her. Carissa Kunko's story emphasizes that evil wears several masks. It could be anyone's brother, sister, or lover. Do you think that justice was served for Carissa Kunko? Do you agree with the death penalty given to Jordan? Let us know what you think in the comment section. Thank you for tuning into our channel. We hope you enjoyed the content and found it informative. If you did, we kindly ask you to show your support by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. We also encourage you to leave a comment below as we genuinely appreciate your feedback and love hearing from our viewers. If you have any case suggestions or topics you'd like us to cover in future videos, please let us know.